Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to Craven County Board of Commissioners' regular session for Monday, October the 1st, 2018. And I'd ask you to put all your phones on the silent ring or turn them off, period. Madam Clerk, could you pull the roll? Certainly. Commissioner Jones? Here. Commissioner Liner? Here. Commissioner McKay? Here. Commissioner Sampson? Here. Commissioner Tyson? Vice Chair Dacey? Here. Chairman Mark? Here. Will we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please stand for the prayer, please. Lord, may your goodness and love be present amongst us today. Come bless our meeting with unity, hope, and vision. Be unto us all the deep respect for one another so that our unity may be one. May your vision fill our lives as we seek to do your will. In your name, amen. Amen. Commissioners, uh, before you is an agenda that uh, I'd ask you to take a look at because it's uh, gave it to you before the meeting just to make sure there's anything in there that you want to add or just approve of. Move to approve. Second. Miss Chairman, if I may, I think it might be appropriate, Miss Chairman, if we um, add um, under item 6B, Mosquito spray and funding for the county presentation by Mr. Scott Harrelson. We it, have that on there. But but the original agenda that was sent out um, that the uh, citizens got, it did not have, did not have okay. that. So I think uh, we need to make them aware. Okay. All right. We have a uh, motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Nays? The ayes have it. Chairman uh, John Robinson. Good evening. Good evening. I'm John A. Robinson, Jr. I'm a resident of Craven County in Commissioner District 2 at 1906 Cayenne Court in Newburgh. I'm a retired Presbyterian minister who has worked in disaster relief and recovery as a volunteer or staff person for more than 40 years. I'm the Vice President of the North Carolina Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster and the Acting President of the Craven County Disaster Recovery Alliance. The fiduciary agent for the Alliance is the United Way of Coastal North Carolina. Until two weeks ago, the Alliance was working on those remaining homes that needed assistance from Hurricane Matthew, and we were collaborating with the Community Development Department <coughs> to see that that happened. That work has not stopped and will continue until all those people are served. I have provided the clerk of the commission the, with the bylaws of the alliance along with some other information that you might find useful as you as a commission move forward in recovery following Hurricane Florence. First of all, CCDRA, Craven County Disaster Recovery Alliance, is a long-term recovery organization working in cooperation with the state of North Carolina the North Carolina Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, and FEMA to provide a means for rebuilding for those who would not otherwise be able to recover without long-term recovery assistance. As part of the Voluntary Organizations Network, numerous faith-based and nonprofit organizations provide support for our work in recovery. You have already experienced some of those organizations that have come here for relief and emergency recovery. But those groups only represent about 30% of the national organizations who do work in disaster. The other 70% will be here as a part of our work through CCDRA. Second, we are not an emergency organization. We do only limited relief work through an unmet needs committee after Mr. Kite and the emergency management agency have finished their work. However, we would appreciate having a continuing collaboration with Mr. Kite 
who has been to CCDRA meetings and, as a matter of fact, made a very fine presentation at our preparation workshop in June at St. Paul's Church. Churches in this area have already been gearing up for the long road ahead to recovery. 36 people representing a broad range of organizations and communities have already met to organize in response to the need in Craven County for this latest disaster. One has decided to turn their educational building into a, voluntary, into a volunteer work team hosting site, providing a place to stay for volunteer work teams with showers, beds, access to a kitchen, secure locations to store tools, trailers, and supplies, and access to work. Strategically, it is located on Old Cherry Point Road <clears throat> in James City. It will be convenient to Havelock and other areas of the county. This will be a permanent hosting site. It will serve 40 to 60 volunteers a week who will come here to help our citizens rebuild. Other churches are preparing to host volunteer work teams on a short-term basis. An experienced group of 17 from Richmond will be here Sunday, prepared to do muck and gut throughout the whole week. They will be staying at the West Newburn Presbyterian Church. I'm here tonight to make you aware of the work of CCDRA and the voluntary agencies of the county and to ask you to designate a voluntary agency liaison to be a part of the alliance meetings to ensure adequate coordination between the county and the alliance as the long-term recovery goes forward. Effective long-term recovery is a partnership among survivors, insurers, government agencies, and voluntary organizations. There are national voluntary organizations that specialize in helping communities recover from disaster who are preparing to come to Craven County as soon as there is a viable long-term recovery organization to help coordinate their work. There are three things that are necessary for recovery, money, volunteers, and coordination. When any one of those disappears, the recovery stops. In the days to come, CCDRA will be setting up public forums, case management processes, and committees to help assist those most in need. No one agency or group can provide all that needs to be done, and that is why it is so vital that we be able to work together closely on this recovery. The watchwords of the voluntary organizations active in disaster movement are collaborate, communicate, coordinate, and cooperate. I'm just asking that we be allowed together to do these four things as the recovery goes forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ray Griffin. Amen. God bless you. Ray Griffin, Vassar, 1981, uh, Road. But anyhow, as I rode through New Bern and bless the heart, I saw all the devastation. It just makes you want to cry. <coughs> and all the things that are happening. And I said, I got my wishes wish one time. Remember, I told everybody here that I wish every beer joint in New Bern closed down to be some peace on Saturday and Sunday. At least God got that wish through city down there. They all closed down now for a while. And they got to rebuild. But anyhow, God's still in control. God still rules and God still reigns and we still got a long way to go and things are still going to have a, kind of a lot of recovery going on. But George Bush Sr. one time, if you remember, preached a lot on the New World Order. New World Order was a simply an organization that says everything's going to become socialist and you can buy a pound of bologna in Germany for a dollar, a pound of bologna in France for a dollar, a pound of bologna in England. United States and the world for a dollar. But if you want plenty of free bologna for nothing, just go to Washington, D.C., and you can get all you want for free. It's a sad world that we're living in and what's going on there. Sad that we're sitting in a situation where the Democrats and Republicans are just gnawing each other down and things are happening, and it's really sad that we need to get out of here. I don't mean this hard to harm me, but the Democrats are becoming an evil party. They're doing anything they can to stop anything that's going on that's good. The Democrats are condoning abortions, which is murder. And the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not murder. Then they turn right around, and now they're saying uh, same-sex marriage. And everything that's against uh, the Bible, they are, they are against everything that's in the Bible. They are today called evil good and all different things. Like I said, we need to get out and vote. When we say, I saw Roy Cooper, and I watched him going through town. He might be doing some good things. But Roy Cooper is an advocate 
of the homosexual rights, homosexual agenda. But what I'm getting at, as long as we keep on doing what we're doing, as long as we keep on putting God to the left, kicking them out of the schools, tearing down the Ten Commandments, tearing down all the crosses, we are going to continue to get what we're getting now. We're just going to get even worse. And when we see the New World Order and these things sitting in, you're going to see a socialist government. You're going to see all these things take place, and things are going to get worse than what they are today. I used to say I would never think I could see things get any worse. But when I see all destruction coming on everywhere, I see all the floods, I see the famines, I see the fires. Everywhere, every nation now is full of floods and fires. I see God is trying to speak to America, and many of us are not listening to what he is trying to tell us. And the people in the Democratic Party, like I say, Nancy Pelosi done the thing on Murphy Brown the other night. She walks out, introduces herself, gets ready to leave, turn around, and gives her a card. And on that card, when Murphy Brown turned around, she read it. She said something to the fact to see what we could be getting, to see what America could be getting and what we have lost by us not voting for Hillary Clinton. Sad world we're living in today, but we need to get back to a, a world that we, we can help each other. Like Sunday, we passed out over 2,000 plates. We went and just got some money, got some people together, and we got 2,000 plates to give out to the victims here in Newburgh. Heard a lot of crying and a lot of tears, a lot of thankful people that there was somebody there to help them. But I'm telling you today, the Democratic Party is not helping people today. They are hurting their own selves, and I see all the fighting in Washington, D.C., and I'm praying to God that people see what is going on, and they will vote for truth and honesty and the Word of God, and they'll get back to God. I'm hoping maybe this storm has brought people to listen. I've always said sometimes before we can listen, God's got to get us down. And I really think that's going on. But when I see people like Obama still on the front line and he's still preaching, and all he done was advocate everything that was um, for the Bible, he advocated against it. Homosexuality, whatever. Anyhow, God bless you and vote the right way. Thank you, Reverend. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, no uh, additional people have chosen to sign up this evening. Okay. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of September 4th regular session and September 21st reconvened session. The board will request to approve the minutes of September 4th and the 21st National Recovery Month proclamation, tax releases and refunds, fire department budget amendment, National Friend of Libraries proclamation, and reschedule of public hearing. A motion so to suck it. Thank you. Is there any discussion? None. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner <coughs> Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Vice Chair Dacey? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. I'm here. Commissioner oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tyson. Ms. Sorry. Commissioner <laughs> Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At this point, I'm going to take Chairman's privilege to make a couple of announcements. One of them, I'd like to have uh, Chairman David Hale of the Board of Education step up to the podium. <coughs> and it is my pleasure to have this opportunity to recognize a group of educators in our school system today who may be a bit surprised about this announcement. And I'm going to let you make the announcement. I shall, and thank you, Chairman Mark, Vice Chairman Dacey, and the commissioners. You know how I love to come up here and brag about our schools? Tonight's no different. It's my pleasure, as you have said, to take the opportunity to recognize a group of educators in our school system. Many, as you said, may not even know why they're here tonight. But if I may, with your privilege, I'd like to bring forward the staff members of W.J. Garganis Elementary School. You would come forward, please. May we? Stepping out front is our principal, Ms. Deborah Hurst. As they gather. In the spring of this year, Ms. Deborah Hurst, principal at W.J. Gregenis, was notified that her school had been selected as a finalist for the United States Department of Education National Blue Ribbon School Award. The National Blue Ribbon School Program recognizes public and private elementary, middle, and high schools based on their overall academic excellence, 
or their progress in closing the achievement gap among student subgroups. Every year, the U.S. Department of Education seeks out and celebrates, as we do, great American schools, schools demonstrating that all students can achieve the high levels. More than 8,500 schools across the country have been presented with this coveted award. The National Blue Ribbon Schools Award affirms the hard work of students, educators, families, and communities in creating safe and welcoming schools where students master challenging content. The National Blue Ribbon School flag gracing an entry or flying overhead is a widely recognized symbol of exemplary teaching and learning. Mrs. Hurst and her co-conspirator have tried to keep this quiet until the official notification <laughs> of the award was provided, and many of us did not know as well. We received that notification late this past Friday. At our next Board of Education meeting, we will offer a resolution celebrating and congratulating this high-performing school staff and their leadership. Again, they bring the spotlight to Craven County, but also to the state of North Carolina and our nation. I'd like to now invite Ms. Hurst. Good evening. First of all, I'm sorry. Um, they're here to answer questions tonight about the hurricane. That's what they were told they were going to do. Um, Operation Live, your staff is in place right now. But so they could do that. They could. Um, but after this, I don't think they're going to let us. But um, it is a great honor and a great privilege to receive this award. Um, for Gaines Elementary, it's very fortunate to have these wonderful staff. And I have a few of my members here with me tonight that I want to Darby Dillington, a third grade teacher, Ms. Jennifer Cabot, a fifth grade teacher, Ms. Amy Bowman, a fourth grade teacher, Ms. Laura Fidera, a first, fourth grade teacher, I'll get ready to take the background for <laughs> Ms. Bjork, a Summer Bjork, a second grade teacher, and Ms. Amy Haskins, our Title I interventionist. Um, these ladies and everybody in Virginia work hard because we know that every student will succeed. And we appreciate all the support we get from our Board of Education, from our commissioners, and from our parents and our community. Um, one of the biggest things we wrote in this that I wrote in this was um, the connection we have with our community and the military community. It's huge in Havelock, and we're so proud of that, and we're so thankful for all those resources that they give us. So I humbly accept this award, as they do, and just and we're just so happy and so proud of our staff and our kids, and we're so thankful that we can come and share that with y'all tonight. So, rock on, Gators! <laughs> Thank you for letting me share this wonderful news and take a few moments away from your meeting right now. I'd like to turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, in turn, would uh, like to say, I am pleased to say, to enable you to share in this good news of W.J. Gorganis Elementary and Craven County Schools. This award amplifies the high standards of the school for their educators and their learners. As a symbol of our congratulations, for W.J. Gorganis Elementary School, we would like to offer a resolution commending W.J. Gorganis for being selected the United States 2018 National Blue Ribbon School. And I'll read that resolution. Craven County Board of Commissioners commencing W.J. Gorganis Elementary School for being recognized as a National Blue Ribbon School. Whereas W.J. Gorganis Elementary School in Havelock is recognized as the 2018 National Blue Ribbon School by the United States Department of Education. And whereas the National Blue Ribbon School program honors public and private schools across the nation that have demonstrated academic excellence uh, and made major improvements to student achievement. W.J. Gorganis Elementary School is second school in Craven County to receive this designation. Whereas the Blue Ribbon Schools Award affirm the hard work by students, educators, and families and community to foster environments like W.J. Gaines Elementary School where learners can reach their full academic potential and successful civic life. Whereas, opened in 1992, W.J. Gaines Elementary School is part of the Craven County school system and includes approximately 400 students in kindergarten through fifth grade. Whereas W.J. Gorganis School is talented, educated, rely on best practices in the classroom to address each student's individual needs and learning styles. 
In addition, Gaganus has a significant population of students who connect are connected to the military and the school amplifies the patriotic values of the best of our nation in our classrooms, with our families and for our community. Whereas dedicated to leadership and student empowerment, W.J. Gerganis Elementary School students lead in their school serving as ambassadors, conducting peer tour touring to their young classroom mates and serving as a great role model for their peers. Whereas W. Gerganis Elementary School engages the community in the school with the Marine of Cherry Point Marine Corps Air Station as part of the Adopt a Squadron program and family volunteers to take an active role in tutoring partnering with educators and supporting every aspect of the work of the school. Whereas W.J. Gerganis Elementary School has an unwavering commitment to the success of every student, employing a continuous improvement model to systematically assess the strengths and provide support for the growth and development of every student. And whereas J. Gerganis Elementary School selection as a blue ribbon school is a tribute to the outstanding work of its students and amplifying the leadership and dedication of its administrators, teachers, and staff. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Craven Board and Count of Commissioners hereby recommend that the school on its selection as the 2018 National Blue Ribbon School by the United States Department and be resolved further that the clerk of the Board of Commissioners prepare a copy of the resolution for presentation to Deborah Hurst, principal of W. J. Gerganis Elementary School, as an expression of the Board of the County Commissioner's admiration for the school's commitment to giving its students strong foundation for lifelong learning. And thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Nays, the ayes have it. Congratulations. <laughs> I also would like to take a little extra time to recognize an individual who I met a few days ago when I was sleeping in a cot in the courtroom. Uh, her name was Maria Figueroa. And uh, she spent some time with us explaining to me and the county manager exactly what uh, they can do for us. And I'd like her to come up and spend some time and introduce each one of the people in her unit. Thank you. My name is Maria Figueroa. I am with the Intergovernmental Affairs Department of FEMA. What I do is I go and visit elected officials during times of disaster. And Excuse me, Maria. Yes. Could you go to the mic because this is on TV. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Maria Figueroa. I am with the Intergovernmental Affairs Department of FEMA. What we do is we visit elected officials and we offer them information about all the programs available for the survivors so that they can inform their constituents. Now, I brought with me subject matter experts on each of the programs. If you want to have them answer questions, they are all here. Um, could you please stand up and introduce yourselves? Could you have them come up? <laughs> Good evening. My name is Abby Eichhorn. I'm with FEMA, and I'm with the Public Assistance Program. So I'm here. I can answer questions in support of the state for um, critical infrastructure, recovery, uh, the grant program that we can put into place to, to hopefully help you recover some of your infrastructure, your public buildings and things like that tonight. Thank you. Okay. Is she going to type some questions? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Rador Stillwagon, and I'm with the Disaster Assistance, and we deal with the individuals and businesses that have been affected and um, I can answer questions about registration and how to get you into the system to get the process working. Good evening. My name's Jerry Haney. I'm the FEMA Division Supervisor for this area, the six counties, North Carolina Emergency Management Area 3, which includes Craven County. Well, 
Hello, I'm Brian Boca, and uh, with FEMA, obviously, and uh, with the Individual Assistance Program. I can answer any individual assistance question you may have. Um, the full gamut of our programs that we have to offer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Kanapik. I'm with the United States Small Business Administration Disaster Assistance. It's here to explain that we're not just for businesses, we help homeowners and renters as well. So I'd like to take some questions and discuss that. Uh, Mr. County Manager, should we do this now? Or you more? Oh. My name is, <coughs> is Carl Ray, and I'm with mitigation with FEMA, and i uh, here to answer any questions in, in regards to mitigation for you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm Angela Bird with FEMA. I am a public information officer, spokesperson um, for the agency. Thank you. So whatever questions you have, you may send that to me, or you can ask them now directly. Later, I will be sending you um, their contact information so that you can contact them and have them answer any questions. OK. Do any of the commissioners have questions? I have some questions and mainly comments at this point in time mm -hmm. because uh, people often associate the federal uh, flood insurance program with FEMA, and they're two different agencies. If you have flood damage, for the most part, to your structure, you call your insurance agent who will contact the federal uh, flood insurance program, and, mm -hmm. and they'll send an assessor out there to, uh, to look at your property, right? Yes. Okay, so your separate agencies, what kind of interaction do you have with the federal insurance program, flood insurance program? We have someone here. <clears throat> they're really not separate. They're one and the same. It's just different branches. Just like if you go uh, uh, to IBM, they have an operations branch and they have a plant management branch, same type of thing. FEMA. Um, do they come under the FEMA umbrella? They do. Okay. okay so, I wasn't aware of that. So when you call them, you are getting different people, but they're people that work with FEMA for FEMA employed by, P by FEMA. There are also uh, agents out in the field working with the insurance agents, the adjusters. Sometimes they're FEMA employees. Sometimes they're, uh, they, they work for the Write Your Own companies, but they're brought in under the FEMA umbrella, given the guidelines for how the, the claim should would be adjusted, and then they go out and do work. OK. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a lot of questions uh, I, I would like to ask. I mean, if somebody wants to go, go down the table, I, yes. I do have some more. Let's see you do it if he takes care of all of ours. So you're, you're with the mitigation part of FEMA, is I that am. correct? I and I think I understood you addressing the, the county government, but you also work with individual homeowners as well. Is that no? Individual who? Homeowners with structures, or are you just with government mitigation? Mitigation will work with individual homeowners, will work with renters, will work uh, 406. There are four parts of FEMA, okay? The first part is, is educating people on what mitigation is and how they can help you. The second part is simply the National Flood Insurance Program. Within the National Flood Insurance Program is the FEMA Insurance Agency. National, insurance, uh, National Flood Insurance Program works with your cities, your counties, and the state on developing floodplain management rules and guidance, and also works with insurance, making sure insurance is available to any county or city that is a participating county or city. So if your city or county belongs to the National Flood Insurance Program, then you, that's a participating community. <coughs> if it does not belong to the National uh, Insurance Flood Program, then it is not a participating community. Okay. Um, there's been some talk about some communities, maybe it's the entire county, I don't know, but if you have uh, damage to your property and you're filing on a, a federal <coughs> uh, flood insurance claim, uh, that if it's over 50% of the value of the structure, that you will have to either raise the property up to the existing floodplain level if you're not there now, or you'll have to pay uh, you know, quite a bit more on your uh, insurance policy when you renew it. Substantial damage adjustments teams are out in the field right now assessing properties that qualify for severe 
damage and uh, substantial damage. If you qualify for that, then you're given the opportunity to, 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 do, to mitigate your home, which is elevation is part of it, maybe a buyout mm -hmm. program that's handled by HMGP, another part of, uh, of mitigation. And uh, so then you are given the opportunity, yes, you, you may raise it or not. If you, don't, if you don't raise it, the base flood elevation at some point in time will be raised for you. And when the base flood elevation is raised, it's approved by the county, it's approved by the city. Once that happens, then everyone's rate goes up that is below that level. And it goes up from in front. The most important thing any of the citizens of any county and any state can do is get something called the, um, uh, my throat's going on me. The, you want uh, some water? Oh, thank you. Uh, we have plenty of water here. <laughs> <laughs> we have nothing else. We have plenty and, of water. You know what <laughs> it's called, you can, you can keep that. It's called, uh, um, You're looking for, uh, get, get into my notes here for a second. I'm getting older, so I forget things that I used to remember all the time. Um, it, phrase your question again for me, please. I can't remember <laughs> what I asked you. <laughs> Can you play the tape back by? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody remember exactly? Elevation certificate. Elevation. Elevation. The most important thing that anyone can get is an elevation certificate. Right. That will be issued by a civil engineer or a surveyor. It's good to within one eighth of an inch. If it's two eighths of an inch, he loses his, his, his right to practice in this state. So it will be right to one eighth of an inch. If you have an elevation certificate, you know exactly how much you would have to pay insurance. Without it, then your agent is taking a wild guess, and most insurance company will rate you. I'm sure you've all had a 16-year-old son, and when the insurance hit and it went from $200 a month to a grand, you went through the roof wondering what was happening. That's what happens when you don't have an elevation certificate. You're spending more money. If you have an elevation certificate, you will get charged the exact amount you need. Once you get an elevation certificate, you can take that to your insurance agent, you can take that to your mortgage company, and the insurance agent will make sure that your rate is lowered immediately, and they also backdate it. And in North Carolina, this may be something for the, is Don Bumgardner in the house? Don? Okay, I believe, I believe that I have read or seen somewhere that the new uh, federal insurance maps uh, for flood have been approved by the state um, is that correct I, uh, no approved by the federal government's the one that they we drawn? possibly approved by the federal government okay, but, but the state has given local communities no notification yet okay my concern is that people get the money to start rebuilding or just before they're ready to rebuild and then the map changes and then they didn't have to elevate their house, and now they may be required to. Uh, is that a scenario that could be possible? It, it certainly is a possibility, but uh, I think that anyone that had the damage would want to try to achieve the proper elevation to prevent it from occurring again in the future. Uh, some of the programs that FEMA has, one of the, the problems oftentimes that we have, there's a lag in that process between when the event happens and when the folks are trying to get back in their homes. So that, that causes us, us some problems. Okay. Can, can I interject yeah, one sure, thing? Absolutely. Because a rumor has been going around, and I think we need to make sure that all of our citizens uh, know this. The flood maps have not changed since 2004, isn't that correct? That is correct. So the rumor that folks are hearing that this Board of Commissioners have changed it in the last since Hurricane Matthew is false. Uh, and that rumor is going around. Uh, so continue okay. on. But I would like to make sure that everybody understands why you're on that because someone said that when the city or county approves the new maps, uh, we're going to have to approve them if we want to continue with the federal insurance program. So, Correct. we, I mean, it's not a, you know, that's, that's their carrot. So, right. and certainly we need to do that. But uh, I could go on for a long time, but in, in the, and, and, 
keeping things fair with the rest of the board. I'm just going to come and see some of you guys uh, maybe tomorrow. But I would like to get uh, Karen, Karen Kay from the Small Business Administration to come up because I think that this is absolutely critical that people understand what the Small Business Administration does, and it's not <coughs> for business only by a long shot. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yes, thank you for that. Um, we spoke earlier, and the, the, I think some of the surprising things that I hear is that uh, renters can get up to $40,000 in property coverage. So what SBA offers is this low is interest a, loans. This would be a loan, not low a grant, interest loans. but they're low interest. <laughs> yeah, we're the second part of the FEMA process. So you folks first apply with FEMA. We want everybody to do that, no matter who you are, business or not. Mm -hmm. And then uh, most of the people who apply through FEMA, FEMA makes a calculation, and some of them will be referred to SBA. They're going to be contacted by SBA via whatever method they gave FEMA, for an email or a phone number. And I, I am hearing from folks that some people will see that on their phone, it says Small Business Administration, and oh, I'm not a business, and they just forget about that. <laughs> They're being contacted by SBA as a result of their FEMA registration and that they should pay attention to that because we're, then second, we're the second part in the disaster assessment process. We want to see what everybody is eligible for. And so we want to make sure that they complete the loan application, even if they're not sure they want the loan or uh, even know where they are at the present moment. It's part of the, the government's federal assistance. So a couple of reasons why we want them to go through the process is, one, you, if we offer someone a loan to repair their property, you can put it on hold so they won't necessarily have to use it right away. We'd like them to just have it in their back pocket should they need it down the road. It's my hope that no one needs it, but it's my experience doing this work that a couple of months down the road, they actually realize that they're going to need some money, and our product always beats the market. We're not a bank, so we don't have to have any fees, and we have costs are much lower. So. That's an important thing for people to understand about that. The other reason is that there's one final grant available through FEMA to those that are referred to SBA. They go through the process with SBA, and we cannot help them. If that happens at a time where we have to decline someone, their name is referred back to FEMA for one more final grant consideration, and we don't want anybody to lose out on that money should that be their situation. Uh, anything else, sir, that you think I'd a like lot to? Of things There's that so I many want things to people to be aware of what you do. So when you register for FEMA, that's why it's critical that you register with FEMA online, on their 800 telephone number, or at their new recovery center, which is right. The old Eccles, Eckers, Eckers. The old mm -hmm. Eckers, uh, right across the, from beside uh, McDonald's. Yeah, and right across the street. On the street, on, across the street from where? The pig. The, pig, oh, the pig. You know, I went to it the first time I went to one of those just last week, and I was so excited. And I looked like a crazy person so happy. So you need to, if you're a tenant, and there's thousands and thousands of tenants. Yes. Uh, I don't know how many were affected, but an awful lot. So renters. You need to register with FEMA. It's very important. And if you register with FEMA, your office with the SBA is going to call them, and there's there's a lot of tools that you have to help people recover yes, that sir. are tenants. And, uh, and, and it, there's so much that I learned. And Commissioner Basie, I know that you, I think, work with the SBA, S, SBI, SBA, whatever. <laughs> oh, SBI. Uh, that, SBI might. sounds kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but, but I would, if I could, um, so mm -hmm. renters can get up to $40,000 for their personal property. Our rates are 2%, so it's very good. Uh, they start at 2%. Most people will receive that. But homeowners, in addition to that $40,000 $40, for personal property, they can get an additional 200000 for the real estate property damage. In addition to that, we have mitigation programs, and we have refinancing programs, we have relocation programs. All of these additional programs are available to those that go through the process and first approve for disaster damage. And for some of these programs, you need to have significant damage, which we know some folks do. Two more points, and then I'm... I'll be quiet, I promise. That's uh, all right. You're you, good you, um, someone um, has a $8,000 deductible on the insurance, and believe me, you, a lot of people have that or more. Can you get a small business loan to pay that? Yes, we can help with deductibles. Okay. We can help with other, other the, the beauty of the system is FEMA helps with this 
portion of it. We help with other things that aren't covered other than insurance. You know, both of them do not duplicate. So whatever insurance pays for, we don't. But one of the beautiful parts about SBA is we want you to come to us first. I know with FEMA's requirement, needing you to deal with your insurance and ha handle that if you have insurance, SBA wants you to come to us first. Just come to us, even if you've got insurance, let's get the process started and give you the funds you need so the recovery can get started now. And that provides you time to negotiate with insurance and come to a settlement. And then we'll just work that out later. You'll just pay us back with that. We're, we're very good at doing that. And we're also very good at modifying any of the loan, um, any of the loan items. You want to look, talk about the, the interest rate, how much money we gave you, the length of time we gave you to pay it back are all items that are appealable and we'd like you to to know that we're trying to make it we're going to stretch it out as long as possible should you need us to because we don't want to make this a burden we're one here to thing, help the recovery one thing i haven't been asked but i'm going to ask anyhow is say you're flooded your house flooded your um your flood insurance does not cover additional living expenses i do not believe is that correct anybody it does not it does not include so if you have to go rent a house or stay in a hotel while your house is being repaired, that's not covered by your flood insurance and it's not covered by your homeowner's insurance, so you're on your own. Are there could be covered by wind and hail. Not if it's flood. And also not not if it's flood. Um, if if you have flood insurance, uh, you are eligible for rental assistance through FEMA. That's why we want you to register. Because okay. flood insurance, yeah, people up to 18 months, they could get rental assistance. Okay. Is that a grant type or is that a loan? Yes. That is a grant. Steve, okay. perhaps we yes. should, because that's exactly the series of questions that I wanted to get into okay. as well. Okay. I'll um, turn it over. I'll yield so my time to Commissioner I Dace. Please come up. And, and ma'am, if you, from the SBA, if you could stick around just one second, please. Sure. So, um, what we have here is the, uh, the housing assistance program that FEMA has. <coughs> And uh, you will, from me, you will hear questions that are based in, unfortunately, my own personal experiences that I'm having to go through. But I think that they are probably representative of what many folks in the community are, are facing today. So I apologize that it may seem as though that's all about me. No, that's and the okay. People that A know me understand just... that that's the case anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But, <laughs> but, um, but um, so we've got, we've got a housing assistance program um, when you, make out your application to FEMA, you let them know that your home is no longer habitable, and then they will send you a little note saying whether or not you have, um, whether or not you're eligible for housing assistance. In my instance, they sent me a note saying that I'm not eligible for housing assistance. I don't know why. Um, I, I went through and, and, and asked the question, okay, well, what are the requirements? You have to have a loss in a presidentially declared disaster area. We meet that. You have to have no insurance or have filed an insurance claim, but the damage for all your losses isn't covered. I have insurance, but again, as the gentleman said, if you're, if you're hit by flood, FEMA's not going to cover you. Your homeowners doesn't cover you for right. flood. So therefore, I meet that. Uh, someone who lives with you is a U.S. citizen. I, I am indeed a U.S. citizen. Uh, affected home is your primary residence, it is, and you can't access your home or your home requires repairs because of disaster damage. Unfortunately, I and many people do fall into that situation. So what, what's the situation? Why did I get a letter of declination? Okay, was your home, is your home accessible? Did you, when you registered, did you say that your home was accessible or inaccessible? Inaccessible. Okay, so that's the problem right there. If your home is inaccessible, an inspector can't come to the home because it's not safe well, it's or they can't that and when once the home becomes <coughs> in, they can come to the home and inspect it they'll reopen that and they uh, and, and that but right now until you have an inspection of your home you, the, everything is going to be denied and okay. that's what the problem is this is very helpful because when you answer that question you're answering it from the perspective of can I use my home or can't I use my home? It doesn't mean that it's inaccessible from an, an inspector's perspective to be able to come in and view the unit. That's certainly okay. allowable. Okay, so then, you, we, then we can, what you need to do is you can either call the 800 number, visit the DRC, and speak to someone and tell them, ask them how they have it listed. If you said your home was inaccessible and the, and then that's how it's listed. Until you go in and have that changed in your file, 
they are not going to send an inspector. Mm. So you have to go and um, have your uh, an update to your case file. Okay. Um, we have got in my district hundreds of people that will meet this qualification. So we will go ahead and get that that yes. word out. Yes. Um, with respect, thank you so much. Sure. You're very helpful. Mm -hmm. So we should go ahead and file. If I, you're an instance like me, file the 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 appeal. Yes, and, and what, what it is, it's not going to be actually an appeal. You're going to call and tell them that your home is accessible. Okay. And they, they will do the paperwork, and they will uh, schedule an inspector to come see the home. And once the inspector comes, then the process should get started. Okay. And I know IA's here, and maybe I'm not answering it quite as well as I should. You may be a better expert at it. Um, I can fill it out a little bit. Um, but you did a good job. Um, there's a variety of reasons why you may get a declination letter, uh, just so you know. Uh, that is one of them, absolutely. Um, if you've also provided any other insurance documentation, just to say, for example, homeowner's insurance, or you, know, you stated in your application that you have homeowner's insurance, uh, that will also put your application on hold. And what will happen is uh, they're waiting for that uh, documentation to come back and say, uh, your insurance company is, in, is not going to cover you for any assistance. So because of the nature of the, of the damage that you had to your home, you may have not only, like was stated earlier, flood insurance, but you may also be eligible for certain types of wind and hail, um, which those do pay additional living uh, expenses. So in those kind of instances, FEMA is waiting for you to respond back to them and say, here's my letter from my insurance company that says, I didn't have wind and hail, or I didn't have that kind of damage, and they're not going to cover me for additional living expenses. Sir, it would be then helpful if mm -hmm. in the letter of declination that comes into the, the individual, if it said, please consider the following issues. Number one, is your house accepts, accessible or not? Did you, did you trigger that? We need to make certain that it's accessible. Number two, do you have other insurance that might cover wind or hail? And if you were a victim of that, that might be an alternative opportunity for you. You know, it would be nice if there was something that would suggest to the person that's receiving this de decline letter what it is that they should be thinking about. I agree completely with you, and typically what I recommend people to do, because their first response when they get receive a, a declination letter as such, they just see uh, you were not eligible for assistance. Right. And they stop at that point on the very first page, probably um, maybe three quarters of the way down. And they give a brief description of some information that doesn't really make a lot of sense at times. Um, to the homeowner themselves or the renter that says FEMA's description is why they were declined. If you read further into the document, it tends to be anywhere from about three to seven pages long, depending upon the type of uh, packet that you've received, okay. but they can be several pages long. It's more than one. So you definitely have probably, I know, I think the letter's now about three pages. Um, if you read through that, it tells you uh, the step-by-step -step process of how to appeal, the length of time that you have to appeal, and um, in some instances, they do have additional information there for you to reference. Um, so I recommend to every homeowner or renter, anybody who's applied for FEMA assistance, who feels as though they did not receive the assistance that they were due, to please go back refer to their, to their letter and follow the uh, appeal process that's listed in there. And, or they can simply call up the 1-800 uh, number for FEMA and they can update their, their file. So like if your home is accessible now, you can let them know, my home is now accessible and I, and I would like to have an inspection. <coughs> At that time, they may talk with you and find out that you have that additional insurance paperwork pending. No problem, I'll send you the insurance paperwork and they'll have a fax number for you to submit it to. So those are all things that'll get your file moving again. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I wanted to add one thing to SBA. Um, when she said, um, you know, not everybody is referred to SBA. Uh, mm -hmm. So, if you're referred to SBA, you need to fill out that application. But not everybody is referred to SBA because at some point they feel that maybe they they can't pay a loan back or what, whatever anyway. Not everybody will get that SBA. So um, those that do, though, do have to fill it out. Okay, if the lady from the SBA could come forward. Um, Ma'am? Thank you so much. Um, and you are on the hot seat because, Good. of course, That's okay. the administrator of the agency is from Craven County. No kidding. So you've got to be concerned about this. You've you got to come through big time. Um, and okay. every, I've seen every, she's in everybody's wedding and everybody's best friend. And I, look at I just texted her right now. And, yeah, it's kind of um, scary. So um, the, the, the loans that you have available, 2%, 
yes, for sir. homeowners up to two hundred thousand dollars. They begin at two percent. Right. Most people will qualify for right. that. But I did notice that if you have assets of your own, mm -hmm. that the best rate that you're going to get is four percent. Can you describe? to the viewers here, what might be the differences between somebody that's eligible for a 2% loan and somebody who's eligible for a 4% loan? Well, you're really working me today. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, that's a very great, that's a good question. Uh, if we like to think of, I like to think of the disaster programs as there to help those that need help, that can help themselves the most. So while the program is eligible for everyone, the lowest rate that the that the that we can provide mm -hmm. is offered to those who don't have credit available elsewhere readily easily and so that's the way we like to that's the way i like to explain it uh, and that's that's the reason for the the two di the difference there. okay so if you've got a um a equity line for your home mm -hmm. that could prohibit you from being able to access the two percent maybe Okay. Um, I, I'm just trying know, to think about of, it's of not examples. such a yeah I can't just the, here's the formula it's cut and dry because it isn't cut and dry for everybody it has okay. there's variables and they're so just, different just your go ahead fill absolute, out, the, fill out yes. the paperwork yes do your best that you can and then let the, let the process work itself through and they will let you know what it is that you're able to qualify for absolutely and presumably there's an opportunity to appeal if you feel as though that you should be mm -hmm. getting the benefit of something else yes so it's imperative that people do fill out the paperwork and ask for what they can so you're gonna you don't ask for a certain amount which a lot of people think well how, how much am I asking for you're just going to apply an inspector is going to come out much like a FEMA inspector will come out and you're going to have that discussion with them about everything you can think of you that's that's when you want to tell them any concerns you have something I'm not sure if that's damaged tell them everything they'll make an assessment they'll come up with a, some formula and then a loan officer will make a decision at that point that's when you're provided with a determination and as I said all of the terms are can be appealed so yes sir and and, and I would say if you if you are that person with a home equity line of credit and you got the higher rate, please take the advantage to, to the opportunity to appeal. Try it. Yeah. Write a handwritten note, and there are things that we cannot describe on a piece of paper or in a form that are just facts of life. I have my parents, or there are other things, other mitigating factors that maybe you can tell us in that narrative that you're. And, and again, so. with this loan, uh, the gentleman spoke about mitigation activities. If you have to raise your house. Yes. This money could be critical for helping you raise the house because this is not an inexpensive proposition. Right, that's and correct. And that while the FEMA could come forward with $30,000, that's really actually just a small <clears throat> fraction of what it's likely to cost many homeowners to raise their home. That's true. I do want to be careful, though, because the, uh, the additional money that is offered by SBA for mitigation mm -hmm. is, 20, is up to 20% of the disaster damage. So that calculation is very important that's made by the, oh. by the inspectors. So we can give you a portion of it. I understand there's this other portion of it in combination with some insurance. That's, so that's the bigger picture. So when you're saying 20%, if one were to ask for $200,000, they would have to have a million dollars worth of loss? Yes. That, now this is in addition to your already disaster damage loan. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll I can have the IA back up. So let me let me ask you this: We've had a, we've had a mobile team down in Havelock for the last week. We're going to get a site this week, correct? Down in Havelock, that would be set up. We've received a large number of denials. So once that office gets set up, can they go in there and find out why, based on? Commissioner Dacey's, I mean, wordy particular. I mean, it seems about everybody that's went in to the mobile site has already gotten their letters back denied. And some of these people have lost everything. I mean, it, you know, so it's got to be about wording then. So instead of calling, can there be somebody there once we get the site set up that they come in and sit down and somebody walk them through this? Absolutely, yes, and in fact, the recovery center that you're, uh, I'm assuming that's the site yes. that they're referring to, yeah. uh, the recovery center, that's its purpose, is for individuals to go there. Um, they are there to, they can serve a number of different purposes. So in the recovery center itself, there are several individual assistant staff that will be on hand to review an individual's case file. So when they come <coughs> through, they'll initially sign in, similar to the mobile <laughs> site, actually, and what will happen is they will then uh, go over to 
uh, an individual assistance um, staff member who will pull up their case file, review their case, and if they have documentation already in hand that they want to submit, they can take it then and upload it into the system for them. Uh, they can answer any questions that they may have. Uh, you know, why did I get a denial letter? And they can help review their case file and help them understand better what the reasoning behind their denial may be. Um, there are also going to be uh, mitigation staff that will be present and um, small business administration staff that will be on site. There could, there could I don't know what all has been coordinated because I'm not part of that piece of it, but there may be additional services there from volunteer organizations or other agencies that have come um, that wish to have a seat there, uh, such as governmental, for example. The county has uh, somebody there for their uh, disaster or substance, uh, supplemental nutrition assistance program. Uh, or otherwise known as DSNAP, the Department of Labor may have a, uh, an office there. It all depends on the services that have been uh, coordinated to be present in that recovery center. Uh, and then, of course, the space that it, it, it will accommodate them. Um, additionally, uh, just to expand a little bit, is I, I, wanna, I want everyone to understand, because the focus is a lot on the housing assistance, so it was just basically the housing repair and rental assistance that a lot of individuals are referring to. But FEMA provides funding and others as other forms of assistance out there beyond just those. So the other needs assistance that you'll hear individuals talking about and is important to understand is that through that SBA process, should an individual stop and say, I'm not filling out any of this paperwork having to do with the Small Business Administration. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't want to do it. At that point, their process, in essence, stops. So unless they are otherwise uh, of a low enough income to be moved forward through the process without the Small Business Administration application being submitted, I strongly recommend that everyone please take the time to fill that out. They don't have to accept the loan, but at least it moves them forward in that application process and in their recovery process. So things that open up at that point are their personal property items. So things they may have lost for their work related, uh, could be things that are associated with uh, their car, um, um, try to think their, their couches, their clothing, things of that nature are what we call SBA dependent. Now, there are things that are not SBA dependent, right, that fall under other needs assistance. Those are things such as medical. So if you had a medical injury as a result of the disaster, uh, say you lost your, uh, your eyeglasses or your dentures or your hearing aid or things of, um, or if you had a death in the family, there's a funeral. Those things are not restricted by uh, uh, eligibility or uh, application assistance through the Small Business Administration. Those are done separately. So those are all forms of assistance that can be provided out in the monetary sense. There's also crisis counseling. I think that's being reviewed at this time. I, I'm not sure on the status of its uh, bill that's been turned on. Uh, but they do provide uh, mental health assistance out to individuals uh, who have been through and you know, been a survivor of the event itself. I know uh, disaster case management is on the table and being discussed at this point. And uh, there are many other uh, types of uh, assistance that's out there right now, both not only monetarily, but hopefully uh, have the mental health side and case management side to help individuals work through the process, which is often complicated, at least it comes off that way when you're trying to get back on your feet from a disaster, uh, to help them guide them through that process uh, the most effective way possible. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one more quick before I go. You know, no, I appreciate everything you said here, but somehow we've got to get the word back out. I mean, these people have received our letters within two days after seeing you. Absolutely. And they've already washed their hands. They said, well, I might get nothing. Can't get anything. And it's all because of wording. And I appreciate what you said. They can come in there, reopen their case, sit down with people, because these people have nothing. Correct. All, I mean, they've, they've lost it all. They don't have most of the case, don't have the insurance. They don't have anything to look forward to. And that's what surprised me of the large number that's been denied already and based on Commissioner Dacey's, what he got for his for wording, I'm sure it's that exactly what it is, but nobody's telling them. They see denial and they're walking and already upset and FEMA can go shoot themselves as far as they're concerned because what they do for me, right. tell me I don't rate nothing and I've lost everything. No, and I understand that completely and you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, it, it, people, um, everyone who receives a denial letter, if you do not feel that that is correct, um, you know, please, 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 uh, appeal. That's fine. That's what the process is there for. Take your documentation and everything you have with you, or even if you don't know what you need to provide, 
just go to the recovery center and those staff in there are very well trained and they know how to walk individuals through that process and identify what the hold points are within their case and let them know okay um, here it shows that we need a letter from your uh, insurance company or um, or we need a letter from a contractor or we need a letter from whatever it may be uh, please go get that and we're still here just bring it back to us and then they'll upload it into their case file from there but most people and I'm getting off course here most people when they see a denial that's it <clears throat> that's it automatically generates a ineligibility letter yes. so you supply that document from this from but again this. if nobody's has explained it right. and walked them through it we've they tried can. for years to get them we're working the field we've tried they, for years to get them to change they, the don't, they don't they don't know you know but i appreciate everything no, you I, and, and, and i completely understand where you're coming from and and they are correct they have worked for years to try to do this stuff but the bottom line is, is that this is happening now, right. and these individuals are receiving denial letters now. So regardless of what message they did or did not get before, the important thing is to, to relay the message that please go to the recovery center, please call the 1-800 number, and those folks can definitely help them walk them through the process and help them understand where they've gotten hung up on. And I believe there's a couple other co uh, commenters behind me. Um, can I correct something really quick? Well, uh, sorry, yeah. um, I want to get back to that example that you, you said. So I want, I want to make sure that this didn't come off incorrectly. So if you've had $200,000 damage, we approve you for a $200,000 damage, disaster damage loan, and you qualify for mitigation, you're going to receive, the mitigation is 20% of that. So you would receive $20,000, right? For, I'm sorry, $40,000. That cleared up? Because it, he raised the issue that um, it might not have come out that way. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I wish they were better numbers. But <laughs> I got a feel it's going to be one of these things that I'm going to have to be told no and then have to come ask again. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the things that was said here is that we've told the people repeatedly, but pe there are people that are moving in here all the time that came from areas that didn't have this destruction or opportunity to have this, <laughs> this destruction. Sir. On the issue of getting the word out to the people, I know that we will work with Chief Kite and your and, and Mr. Vite with the uh, county POs and the FEMA POs. I know we'll be in touch with North Carolina's uh, emergency management POs, and we'll put the word out every which way we can. And and you're right, we need to get that word back out to appeal, appeal, appeal. And, and that's good, and I really appreciate that. But I think it takes each one of us because they're coming to us Every and, one and we hear it and we've got to make sure we understand it. Say, just because you've got a denial doesn't mean you were denied. You've just got to go back in and I think the biggest thing I've heard on it, once we open up our, our center, that they can go in one-on-one -on -one with a person. I'm not saying that the mobile team did anything wrong. They were great. They were on site. But trying to push people through, you at the time they were there just getting over it they didn't know the questions asked they didn't have anything to bring through it so as odd as it may sound the denial letter may be the second step in the process okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. commissioner sampson I, i'd like to say I, i've been i've been through a lot of the process i, I had their uh, inspector excuse me can you speak quiet I had this, or uh, one, one of the inspectors came, came by the house. He, he was the wind, wind inspector. Now, they got wind and they got water. Water don't cover wind, wind don't cover water, from what I can understand. <laughs> so you got to have, look like got to have two inch on. But when they went around, they look. Look like they were looking, looking at the house for something that happened before, before they were put it down, that that that, that this storm didn't cause it. See, but when something happened before and that storm come, it can make it worse. And then the water inspector came through, flood, and and, and the water came up about, I said it came up about six, six foot. And, uh, and they come in there and they, they look at the, the flow. The flow look all right right now, but if that water touch that flow, that flow got bustled. And it looked like they weren't considered that. 
But they right there to write. But I told I told the inspector concerning that. They grew up on your roof. I had them grow up on one one, one of the lower roof of, of my house. And they went up there and looked. He said, it looked pretty good with snapping pictures because I, I wanted to make sure it was all right when they finished. So if it's not, I'm going to make sure I snap pictures and send them to them. Because they, they already are raw. I had my house recertified, had, had the, the, the uh, person come out there and redo the whole elevation certificate. And they went and looked at it and, and, and shot, had their, uh, not a uh, surveyor come out there and he checked all the parts on it. Now, my, my insurance at that time was over $1,000. And when, when they did that, my insurance came down about several hundred dollars. And so I, I don't follow all the rules and regulations. And now they, they say that anything on the outside of the house, they only don't, don't, don't count that. In your yard or your fences and everything, they don't even count that. So why why don't they count some of the damages around the house? They don't for water or for wind, water or wind. They don't they don't count. So um, if I may, I I want to clarify uh, some of the of um, discussion that that we're having here. So some of the inspectors, what you're referring to when you say a wind inspector has come out versus somebody who's looking at the water, that's typically insurance. FEMA has one inspector that comes out. Yeah. FEMA has one inspector uh, that will come out for the housing assistance side, okay? So if there's a flood insurance inspector that's coming out, that's, that's different. And as far as what they are allowed to look at, I would, I would rather, I feel more comfortable letting mitigation speak to that. But before I do so, I'd like to cover just a couple things. The FEMA inspector is going to reach out to the individual at the household, or they'll identify themselves, and they'll try to set up a time to come out and look at their house, okay? When they come out, they're looking at it for all, t all types of damage that has occurred to the home. They're going to assess it all at once. And they're going to have a badge, like what I wear right here. All right? Theirs may say FEMA contractor or something, but it'll, say, it'll be a FEMA badge. It'll have their picture ID on it. And I recommend that, the, that you know, if anyone ever feels uncomfortable about somebody being at their house, to ask them, you know, just ask them that you're right to identify themselves. I mean, don't take the badge. But you know, ask them to show their badge, identify themselves. And um, that's their opportunity then to clarify, you know, okay, this is who this agent, this is who this person works for. And uh, now in terms of what FEMA considers as eligible assistance, th the inspectors identifying that when they go out there. But I will say that it's not only limited to the house. For the most part, it is, okay? But things like septic, so things that are tied into your utilities, so like your septic system and your well, those could be eligible to paint upon whether or not they were damaged. So, uh, but as far as debris in the yard, a uh, fence that's taken down, or a shed that's out back, FEMA inspectors are not going to be concerned with that piece of it. Now, that's not to say that the insurance companies won't be, because they, you know, your policy may cover outside buildings or, you know, other structures. But in terms of the FEMA assistance, they are looking at, you know, pretty much the footprint of the home outside of things that are considered your utilities. So, um, that's an important thing to understand as well. And I think it's also important to understand that any financial assistance that FEMA gives anyone is, is not to make them whole. There's other agencies out there that do that. There's the Small Business Administration. They can help make people whole through their loans. Uh, the insurance companies are there to help people become whole again. FEMA is there to help bridge a gap in your emergency, in your, in your recovery, okay? It takes you from, I have no shelter or nothing over my head to, we can fix these things to make your home safe and habitable again, to return to. So that's where FEMA comes into play. If somebody who's lost their home entirely, they may need additional assistance. So they may have to go to a voluntary organization, or they may have to go look at the Small Business Administration and see if there's assistance through there. So they may have to look at other alternatives if they have no home left to go to. But FEMA will still, should they be eligible, provide them the assistance that they can. <clears throat> Did that help answer your question, sir? But, but one, one thing, see, I already filed, I filed with the insurance. I went out there and filed with the insurance company. And then the raw they, they said, they said FEMA would be by the house to look at it. And they, they, 
Yes. And I already saw. I had two, two inspectors already come by. You know, another before to come by and finish up. That's more than likely the mitigation uh, guys who came by. I'll let the uh, gentleman here speak mm -hmm. to that. It is confusing. <clears throat> Individual assistants has their inspectors who come look at your home and look at your property within the home. Okay, that's part of that's part of one branch. So like you've got, like I said with General Motors, you're going to have your plant, you're going to have your production, you're going to have your <coughs> facilities departments. FEMA overall is a big company. FEMA has individual assistance, as the people have, have addressed earlier in the day. They're looking for specific issues. They have their inspectors. Mitigation has their inspectors. We have inspectors for 406 that work closely with, uh, with PA, public assistance, and work, and work, and work uh, with the cities and counties. Sometimes they're in the area and someone says, oh, they're the FEMA inspectors. So that gets a confusion going. Mitigation has several groups of inspectors. When we're doing studies for uh, uh, substantial damage estimates, that's one group of inspectors. You've got three people who pull up to a home. One person goes to the front left corner of the house and gets a, a GPS reading on it, while the others are determining the amount of water that got into the house. They're documenting that damaged property. Then there's someone uh, for um, flood insurance that come in. So there's all kinds of inspectors. It's important for you to ask when they come on your property, let me see your badge, let me see your jacket, who are you, for what purpose are you here, how can I help you, and then let them do the inspection. But take, take their name, take their badge number, get all the information you can, and then pick up the phone, call the DRC and say, we have these inspectors out here and I don't know what they're doing. They say there was someone. And, um, and, and, you know, if that person can talk to them and find out exactly where they're from or what they're doing. They were, they were from FEMA. I, I know it's called. I talked to them. And, and I was wrong. I was just a little upset because when they, when they kind of nitpick and, and say some certain things don't happen, because I know within, by, by being here so long, I know that. If you if water get under your house and touch the bottom of that those of that flooring, that floor gonna buckle. And if they see the floor not buckle when they're there, they're not gonna take that in consideration. I know in mind. The important thing to remember with FEMA, as a whole, all the different branches, the important thing to remember is appeal, appeal, appeal. <laughs> If you don't like the finding you got, continue to appeal until someone tells you clearly why you're not covered or they look at it and say, oh, okay, you've got a right to request different inspectors to come out and look and see if it's different. So appeal, appeal, appeal. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question yes. on Mr. Sampson's uh, point? Yes, uh, and, and regular home insurance, if you have a claim and, and then there's uh, I would say damage attributable to that claim discovered later on, uh, then that's generally covered by that by the claim by the same claim, so you don't have another deductible. Is that the case with Commissioner Sampson? If you had floors buckled six months from now, and it it could be determined that that was caused yeah. by the storm, would that be covered yes. under the if, same claim? Do you have additional damage that you didn't report initially? or that wasn't inspected with contractors' estimates or documentation that state that that was caused from the flood, that's when you can go back and appeal that. So, and, and um, that is but they want documentation, you know, they, they want to, to be provided contractors' estimates and documentation. But you can appeal that because a lot of people uh, don't realize something that happened in the trauma or, you know, a month or two down the road. So it's, it's all appealable. So in the private sector insurance, uh, it, the rule of thumb used to be, and I've been out of it a while, three years, that you could go back and claim against a, yeah, an I open. Yeah, I can't answer that, the private, okay. but FEMA, you can appeal that. Uh, what length yeah. do you know that? Mm -hmm. that? Is there a time limit? Probably up to the next next uh, disaster that comes through. I mean, okay. so if you can tie it into this disaster, okay. then you can appeal it. Okay. And she's speaking from an IA perspective, 
but from a floodplain insurance perspective, that's true as well. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to go after Commissioner Leiter. I'm sorry, one more thing. Commissioner Sampson, there is some good news, though. SBA will help you with the things that FEMA won't help you with. <laughs> <laughs> SBA will. They will help you with fences and other things that FEMA won't help you with. So come on down. We're waiting for you. Very Blue shirts. <laughs> All right. Will you tell us where you're located? We are located at the Eckers building next to McDonald's. All the across from, across from, from the, the pig. pig. <laughs> <laughs> All the best there, but I didn't, I didn't question no one. Well, we need to question you, I think, is the way to go to the Commissioner Lyon. This young lady's got an answer for me, or she's been trying to get up here. Um, I just, before going through the appeal process, visit our recovery center. Check with IA, have them pull up the case file, see if there's something you need to provide us. And then if that, all that information is what's provided, they will also instruct you on how to go through that, what you need to go through the appeal process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and the most important thing is, Eva's not going to be here forever. And we're going to be here as long as we're needed. But the best line of defense always, and if people like one-on-one, -on -one, is 1-800-621-3362. That is the bottom line. You're going to get your best answers from there. Repeat that number again, please. 1-800-621-3362. If you don't understand, just say help. <laughs> that, is, that is with nothing else. And, and some people aren't going to be able to get into that recovery center. And I know the lines are busy now, people registering, calling for case inquiries and that. But that truly is a the best information you're going to get is from those people working that. They do that every single day. So um, that's a good thing to pass on to us and the DRC. Uh, I've, I've always got to give my uh, disability partners a, uh, uh, a ring out there, and it's important to understand that recovery centers will be ADA accessible. There will also be ADA equipment there that should be available for people who have uh, visual or hearing impairment issues. Um, as far as the uh, phone lines go, uh, those that uh, are non-English speaking need to call in and register. They are able to do that. They should be able to provide uh, interpretive services for them as well. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, one last thing from my part on a little personal experience deal. So we show up to the house after having been gone. I, I took the advice of the chairman and I evacuated. Came back. And we were... We First were, time he ever took my advice. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were fortunate enough to have um, a connection through our insurance company to have somebody come over that would take a look at remediating the house to do get all the stuff out of the house. But they ask us to sign these agreements. And I'm hearing these numbers of $40,000, $50,000. And I've got no way to know what's appropriate here. What should I be signing? What shouldn't I be signing? Is there any, is there any rule of thumb here as to how big my house is and what, what it should cost in order to do these things? And you're at their mercy because you're just happy that somebody is there in front of you and is willing to, to take the, the stuff out of your house. And if there's some way that, and I, and I know that for this particular event, we're past the timeline, but if there were a way that we could get the word out ahead of time, if we know that we're, we've got a disaster coming on and we're going to expect these legions of, of recovery folks to come in, and, and Steve, I know you Mr. Tyson, you were in this business for a long time. You and I, I had the good fortune of being able to call you up and say, what's appropriate here? Give me a little bit of guidance. But without Commissioner Tyson, I would have been up a crick. Is there any resource that just maybe I wasn't familiar with that could give somebody that's in my position a better frame of reference so that they don't get taken to the cleaners? Is this before the storm they were trying to take the no, storm? No, no. This is after. After. after yeah, yeah. Uh, so I... I've been doing this for 12 years, individual assistance. And um, I, I'll be honest with you, there's a number of contractors that will run into an area, and uh, typically what you're referring to would be a, a contractor that's offering some sort of service. Uh, you know, Sir Pro or whatever. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, th these are individual agreements that you're making with that, that company. So 
in many instances, what ends up happening is in an area that's been you know deeply impacted, such as this, um, restrictions are placed on what kind of contractors can come in, and they've been pre-approved. And, uh, and and if that has not been done, maybe that's something that you all would like to take into consideration in terms of permitting who comes in this area to assist individuals. Um, many small many uh, large to small towns, it doesn't matter, counties, uh, you, there's an existing permitting process that's already in place for a contractor to come in and do work. Um, during times of disaster, many, many times they'll expand upon that and say, well, you need to come in physically and so that we know that you're not here, you're not a fly-by-night, for example, and try and take advantage of our population. Uh, these are things that typically I recommend to, to any government um, county or, or city that is dealing with this in time of a disaster so that they can kind of manage um, the services that are being rendered to their population. Um, there are many fly-by-nights that will come in. There are, I promise you, there will be contractors that will try to take advantage of people, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the best thing to do at that point is for, um, if somebody feels as though they've been taken advantage, uh, you know, there's the, uh, there's the state attorney's office, there's, I'm sure, uh, the countywide here, you guys have somebody that can be, that folks can call as well. Uh, we have disaster legal services that can provide some level of assistance as well. And I, I recommend all those to those, those individuals. Anytime you're dealing with a private entity, uh, I caution anybody working with them to, to do their homework. And you're right, it is overwhelming. But I do want you to understand that on the flip side of that, that there are many volunteer organizations that are out there as well who are ready, willing, and capable to support and help. So uh, I know there was a discussion early on about bringing, you know, into the long-term recovery committee or setting up a, all right, I gave you a, I gave you a bite there. So uh, it, it's, imp I would, it's important, it is important, because that helps coordinate those volunteer agency resources to, to reach out and assist individuals who need the, the help. Yeah, see, that, that was my problem. I we knew that there were entities like that coming into our community, but I also knew that I was fortunate enough to have the, the homeowners, or the, the FEMA insurance, and I didn't want to occupy those people. It just didn't seem right. Right. No, and and it, it, I think the important thing to understand is that uh, many people who come in to offer their services will tell you, and they'll tell anybody, this, oh, fee, send your receipt into FEMA, FEMA will pay for it. That's uh, not that entirely would. accurate. And I think if you have the flood insurance, that's something that you need to talk to a flood insurance agent before you move forward in those kind of decisions. I'm um, oh, sorry, sir. No, I, I was going to make a suggestion that uh, if you're if you're going to be have a contractor put in the situation where hey, you need to have something done, or at least in your mind you need to have it done right then, and you have a contractor that comes out and gives you a proposal before your adjuster, I would. I would pencil in at the bottom an initial that you'll be reimbursed what we get reimbursed by the flood insurance. Most most of the big companies, the disaster recovery companies, or they work off the industry standard for insurance. I mean, I, I would think FEMA is probably similar to what the private insurance adjusters use, you know, for the mitigation work to certain and standards. reconstruction. There's probably not a big difference. Uh, I would venture to say, and uh, you know, that's... Well, okay. yeah, unfortunately, the two agreements that I looked at both said that if FEMA doesn't cover something, you will cover it personally. And well, you know, you're caught between a rock and a hard yeah. spot. And, I, I, and that, that's know, why I was wondering yeah. if there was some way to help educate the public to say, you know, here's a good rule of thumb, or I love your suggestion about, and Mr. County Manager, if, if, if we haven't already done this, we should think about it for the future. Yep. Pre-clearing these companies before they come in and seeing if there's a way that we can wow. make certain that, because there's, there's no publication. I asked them for their rate sheet on what they're charging per hour to take the, 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 the stuff out from underneath the house. They wouldn't give it to me. They said, we don't know. You know, we don't know what the reimbursement rate's going to be for this storm. It depends on zip code. And so, it, it, <coughs> it, it, and it, to an extent, they're not entirely wrong. There is RS means that many are, uh, and I'm not, not mean to use, yeah. a, I don't know what RS means stands for, other than I know that it's the, uh, the system in which they uh, tabulate costs associated with uh, repair, cleanup, and, and uh, debris removal. Um, but I, I do want you to understand that, you know, if these kind of questions are coming up, that's why we have a PIO that's here. Um, that's a perfect opportunity for, you know, you should be having these discussions with your state counterparts and saying, you know, we are, these are our concerns. And we would like some messaging to go out in coordination with FEMA 
to ensure that this goes out in wide public distribution so that people understand um, kind of what they may have to deal with as they're out there, either whether it be coordinating uh, resources to come in to, re to remove debris or their items from their home um, uh, before they receive their, ins their insurance or whatnot, um, all the way through <coughs> repairs to their home. So, and that way there's a coordinated message that goes out and you know everybody's getting the same message. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, number one, I would like to, to thank Maria after spending a half hour and talking to her, I thought it'd be a good idea that she come in and bring the people that can help us uh, answer these questions. And I think you've answered a lot of questions tonight, and I think you all did a very good job in presenting each individual one. And I just want to thank you, and I'm sure the commissioners want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Good. We're here to help. And one thing that you have to remember as I was talking to Mr. Tyson the other day, we need to manage people's expectations. That's, that's one of the things that we were clear about. FEMA will not make you whole, as they say. They will give you something to get back on your feet, but you need to follow the process. It's a long process, but it's a plus, the process that has worked until now. Mr. Chairman, before, I, I'm assuming that you're getting ready to close that part of the meeting. Yes. Can I ask one more? Yes, you can. Okay, Time. thank you, Mr. Chairman, because it's one that hadn't been addressed, and uh, a, a lot of people are displaced, as you know, and, and I've got a friend that called me today and said that he's got a two-bedroom, one-bath house, and there's 12 people there. Um, so they're camping out in his house, and he, he's glad to help them. But, uh, the, you know, I've had questions about FEMA trailers, mm -hmm. and uh, I've had questions about campers and, and so on and so forth. Where is the decision process if it has been uh, touched on that yet? And, and I think that's important. I mean, if That'd you say they're not coming, that's fine. We need to know that. It, we're setting expectations. If you say it's going to be, they are coming, but it's going to be three months or four months because we haven't even identified places to put them. Um, I, I can tell you this, that the state is uh, uh, spending quite a bit of time to consider, not taking a lot of time, but they are putting a lot of effort into right. determining um, the need to bring in, uh, whether it be RVs or um, what we call manufactured housing units, and how that, how that will be done, if it will be done. And so they are submitting that request. Um, FEMA is also looking at that. I'm actually part of the assessment team that's going around determining some of that. Um, right now, um, what we call direct housing or, you know, the uh, manufactured housing units or the RVs, uh, should they be used, uh, has not been authorized in any part of the state, uh, but it's not to say that it will not be later. Uh, what I would recommend, it would, well, what will happen is should that occur, that will be very publicly disseminated. So they will, be, trust me, everybody will see the units coming in. Uh, there will probably be news coverage associated with it. And then what will happen is uh, people will be, will be contacted individually to determine whether or not um, they have a need for one of those. But right now, that's not a program that has been turned on. And the state actually is the one that um, assesses that? I didn't, I didn't realize that. I thought that would be the FEMA and the federal government. I am part of the assessment. Yes, okay. FEMA does go out and assess that. But the state submits their request. Uh, to determine whether or not there's a need, and I, I know the state's going to submit a request for it. Okay. Um, but for the most part, that has to go through, be evaluated. Our headquarters, actually, uh, FEMA goes up to there and they make a determination because it is a very costly venture, and we want to make sure that there is a, uh, a definitive need um, to be able to support that kind of mission and that there's not already available uh, rental resources because we are providing individuals with, with rental assistance. Um, Let me interrupt you real quick. Yes, sir. Because um, I have a property management company, and uh, out of the 300 apartments or houses that we have before the storm, I had one vacancy, and I've spoken to other agencies that are larger than me, and I'm sure you've probably spoken with them too, and their numbers were similar. Right. And absolutely. And, and so we, that's part of what we do our evaluation. We look at the available housing resources throughout the area, and then based upon either the surplus or lack thereof, there may be, you know, that's where the, those, those decisions are made to say, okay, you know, this county needs to have uh, direct housing, for example. Uh, we don't know that yet. So we're out doing that assessment. We're trying to pull that information together. And once that's done, then 
like I said, those individuals will be reached out to individually. Typically, um, how long does that take? Honestly, I can't speak to it. It varies well, by disaster. You've, you've been in one of these before, though. I've been several You can give us several weeks, months. Um, again, it honestly, it depends on um, the, the, the what well, the process does, that's established. Does it depend on how fast our state government operates? Because if that is the case, then we need to know that. It typically will uh, take, I can imagine that the, the process to determine whether or not to turn on a direct housing program uh, will probably be taken into consideration probably within the next uh, month or two. Okay. Good. There's a that's, lot of work involved. That's, that's, uh, that's information that we need to know. Yeah. So we but I want to caveat and say, expectations. I want to manage expectations yeah. other though it could move much quicker. But I'd okay. rather tell you a further out Thank time you. frame than You can understand. be our point of contact on this question. Is that correct? I'm sorry. No. No? No. no. I, 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 okay, Maria. Yeah, she would be. Okay. 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 Thank you. All right. The only thing that we haven't covered so far, and it will be covered by the county manager later on, is the amount of debris that is out on our lawns and roads. So he will cover that later on, I believe. Correct? Yes, sir. Well, okay. we, we have someone from public assistance who can talk a little bit about that if you um, need anything. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. So for Hurricane Florence, uh, the, the FEMA and the state have worked really closely together to develop a special policy so that private property debris removal, PPDR, is allowed in most cases. Now this is, there's still very, a lot of caveats to this. So it is very important that if a, a housing authority or a gated community would like to participate in private property debris removal, if uh, a community has a significant amount of private property, private property debris removal, removal, that we work very closely with your county emergency manager who will put in a request to the state to get this approved. It is still a, a very touchy subject because public assistance does not typically cover private property debris removal, PBDR, I'll shorten that. However, because of the intensity of Hurricane Florence, obviously there are going to be an, an increase in the debris that's going to cause public health concerns, safety concerns, emergency route concerns. Those are the things that would turn on the necessity to support that. So there is a, a fact sheet, I'd be happy to send that out to Maria who can send that out to disseminate it widely to kind of outline how that would work. Bottom line is we are supporting it. However, we want to work very closely with the county emergency manager in the state to make sure we're meeting all of those qualifications for we've, eligibility. We've already applied for that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Do you have questions specifically regarding it? No, I Debris? think the, I do. You do? I want to ask a question we talked about. Has a, has a decision been made on private roads, told we were going to do it, do we have to get release of liability from every owner on that road? Or are we just going to go in and pick it up? That's a good question on the every owner. I do know that the county would want to get approval. They, they need to be able to show that they have authority and permission to be on that road. Now, the, the way that we go about that, I'm actually not real sure what the process would be for the state of North Carolina, but I'm happy to look into that for you. I, I, can, I can attempt to answer that. I yes, believe Gene and I were just talking about this tonight, that the governor's already given that blanket approval. Okay. And I, I'm sorry no one from DOT is here to, to check me on that, but we understand that's already happened. And we have a couple checks and balances that we have to do locally, but that approval should be there. So the doc will be removing that? Not from a private road. Not from a private road, but right. from a, a but, but state road. The, correct. The, the, the DOT will handle the, pri the, the public roads, the public state roads, right. and then the private roads will fall under our contract that the county has. So okay. I can't speak to what DOT is going to do, but I can speak to the private. Okay. Road. So there's no release of liability or no paper signing? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> Only if it's gated. And that's no, the one not, that we're working on a, separately. That is a separate requirement, which we'll have that. That process has already started. On the private road, yes, we've already got the ball rolling. Okay. Um, Maria, I want to thank you very much. I also want to ask that if there are things that you need, that you come to us and you look to this board to be helpful to you. Um, there are a number of us that are on this board 
that can get answers for questions or get people to move things done, to get them done as quickly as possible. So if there's something that's, that's holding you up, please let us know, and we can go to work to get things done for you as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. That, uh, um, we run into some residents that have bagged their trash, um, and there's been a little bit back and forth about whether or not it will be picked up, if it's bagged or not. Yes, it, it's appropriate for residents to bag their, their debris if they would okay. like to. Yes, they don't need to pull out of trash bags to get to have it picked up. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Geez, I guess I could have had my Sunday night back. In the <laughs> okay, let's move along now to the uh, item number two. All right, let's take a five-minute break. Yeah. Yeah. The agenda is. Oh, we you lost your. You lost your. Where, where'd my chief oh, go? Oh, three people. <laughs> uh, we got a quorum. Oh, you got a quorum. You got right? somebody from the fire department. Stanley, do you see Chief Blaylock anywhere? Have, have him come up. Next is uh, Department of Matters Emergency Service EMS grant app, uh, match and Travis Bapp. Clock. Playlock. Playlock. Yep. Chief. Good afternoon or good evening. How are y'all doing? Uh, the audience kind of shrunk, but <laughs> I won't say that personally. Um, so this grant we apply for, we apply for it typically every year it's through the North Carolina EMS and Rescue Association. Um, we are eligible this, for this grant because we are a medium duty rescue provider. Uh, that is a certification that the department obtained above and beyond our uh, North Carolina Department of Insurance fire rating. Uh, in 2017-18 we applied for the grant. Uh, to purchase 20 sets of turnout gear, complete sets, boots, pants, coat, hoods, helmets, gloves, and everything. It's about $2,500 a set of gear. Uh, right now we have 75 firefighters in our department. Average lifespan for a set of gear for us is eight to 10 years, so we need to buy about seven sets of gear every 10 years. So we have about two and a half years worth of gear through the grant. Um, my request here tonight is to get $24,712.60 in matching funds for this grant. Okay. So, uh, move for approval. Ms. Second. Uh, hold it, ma'am. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, may I recommend, since this was technically a last year's budget item, he is a year behind coming to request it, I would recommend the board that the fire, or this department keeps a amount of fund balance on our books, not his fund balance, it's in his account. So on our books, I would recommend and the finance officer has a budget amendment to take that from those account, from that account. Okay. Uh, I think we've done that before in a couple situations. Uh, I think that would be the right way to go. It was with Vanceboro you did that most recently. Yeah, Vanceboro, right. Second in the motion. Question. Do they have sufficient amount that won't deplete them from? Yes, sir. On June 30th, they had about Okay. This isn't money that the department. This is Great. not. This is on our books for Great. them to balance their account based on what taxes. Understand. Low. So they make sure they get the amount they request. So that the motion then would be for that to come out of the reserve our reserve account. From out of the fund balance held on the fund balance books right. for this department. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. I'll second. second read. Oh. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Nays? The ayes have it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Mark <coughs> Manners Carts. The North Carolina Department of Transportation, Public Transportation Division, or NCDOT, PTD, has released the grant applications for fiscal year 2020. Each requires the opportunity for public input as well as a public hearing. Applications for these projects must be submitted no later than November 2nd, 2018. NCDOT, PTD, has specified that one combined public hearing be held if so desired. CARTS will be asking for a public hearing to cover three grant application requests. 
The first grant application is the 5311 Community Transportation Program, or CTP, grant and is a formula-based allocation grant for public transportation projects in non-urbanized areas. CARTS relies on this grant to assist with the administrative cost of operation in the non-urbanized service area. The second grant application is a 5311 CTP operating grant. CARTS is eligible to apply for this grant as an urban and rural split system. The total amount of the 5311 admin and the 5311 operating cannot exceed the total 5311 CTP allocation amount specified by the state. The 5311 operating would assist with expenses for non-urban transportation expenses such as dispatcher salary, driver salary, fuel, etc., based on a cost allocation. These expenses are not allowed in the 5311 ad admin grant. The third grant application is the consolidated capital application. Capital projects are to be included in a consolidated application, which does not specify in which grant capital projects will be placed. This allows NCDOT PTD flexibility based on grant availability, and that determination is made at the state level. The capital purchases planned for fiscal year 2020 at this time are for the purchase of replacement vehicles and possibly two computers. The grant application information will be completed and available on the Craven County website no later than October 8th. CARTS is requesting a combined public hearing be set for October 15th meeting regarding the grant applications that CARTS will be requesting to submit to NCDOT PTD for fiscal year 2020. Okay, so uh, board action is to approval to hold a public hearing on October 15th, 2000. That should be 2018, I believe, shouldn't it? That's correct, sir. Yeah. 2018 okay. County Commission's meeting regarding grants request for FY2019 to NC.BPTD. I have a motion. So, so move, Mr. Chairman. All those in favor, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Nays, the ayes have it. Okay. We have now a you have some information for us. I do have some information. This is um, in regards to the Rural Operating Assistance Program, or ROPE, um, which is a state-funded public transportation grant program that is administered by the NCDOT PTD. ROPE cons consolidates the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Assistance Program, or EDTAP, for the rural and urban areas, the Employment Transportation Assistance Program, or EMP, for the rural and urban areas, and the Rural General Public Program, which is RGP, for the rural area, all into one application. Each county within the CART service area is responsible for making a ROPE, rope application for its respective county. Craven County has been allocated $90,472 for EDTAP, $23,860 for employment, and $84,304 for RGP. These are the same amounts um, as last year, except for a $410 reduction in RGP. The RGP requires a 10% match, which is covered by fares that we charge to the passengers. A public hearing is not required to apply for this funding. In addition to the completed application, a certified statement signed by the county manager and county finance officer is required. And this is okay. for uh, the current fiscal year 2018-2019. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I have a moment of yes. privilege? I want to tell you what a great job Kelly did during the hurricane. Uh, some of the most complicated transportation activities I probably have ever witnessed um, before and after the storm. And she did it with uh, grace and uh, leadership, and she deserves all the kudos in the world. I, I, when I went into that room, I don't think I ever seen her not there. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she hung with us for seven days through thick and thin, and she did a great job. Thank I'm really you. proud of her. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Let's do it. Department Manage Planning, Y16 Flood Mitigation Assistance, M FMA program. And that's done long, Gardner. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we are in the process. Uh, we recently bid out uh, a total of five repetitive loss structures. These are structures that FEMA has identified as structures that would be eligible to be considered 
for some type of assistance. In this particular case, the people applied for the process of having their homes elevated. Um, the five of those structures were bid out. Uh, we ended up receiving uh, a total of four contractors that uh, are both local and from out of town, J.E. Dillahunt Associates, uh, Paul Woolard Construction, the IMAC Group, and Goose Creek Construction. Those were the four bidders that bid. Uh, with regard to those four, uh, four out of five bids, the lowest bid that was received was above the total amount of funding allocated for the structures. Therefore, we're recommending that four of the structures be rebid. Uh, notices of the rebid will be advertised and sent out again to the original contractors as well as anyone else that would have an interest again in submitting a bid. Um, as for the one unit, uh, one of the units that came in within the budget, we're recommending a contract award with a contractor submitting the lowest responsible bid. <coughs> The property is located at 911 Devers Avenue, that's in the city of New Bern. The group uh, that is, uh, was the lowest bidder is called IMAC Group LLC in the amount of $96,000. Uh, we at this time need a vote to approve the contract award in order to move forward with this particular structure. Again, this is money that comes from the Federal Emergency Management Agency um, <coughs> Department of Flood Insurance. Yes. Okay. So move. We have a motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? I'm going to ask a question about this afterwards, after it's approved. All righty. <laughs> Still went down to run away. <laughs> okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, then there's no discussion right now. Do I have a motion to, I uh, mean, uh, everybody in favor say aye. 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 No, the nays, I <coughs> have it. Now you can ask your question. Mr. Mumpgartner, the folks that were here earlier said that $30,000, up to $30,000 could be made available to help raise a house. Correct. The number that we just approved here for the low bidder for IMEC Group for 911 Devers Avenue is for $96,000. So does that mean that the person who resides at 911 Devers has got to come up with $66,000? No, this is 100. This particular program is 100% funded by the Federal Flood Insurance Agency. Therefore, the homeowner does not have to come up with any money. As a result of the Anytime there is a disaster, there's an independent uh, group, it's called ICC, funding that allows up to $30,000 that someone can apply for uh, through their insurance agent, go through their insurance agent, go through FEMA to receive that particular funding. So the balance of that funding would have to be borne by the property owners. But this and is a different program. This right. is a different program. That is correct. Okay. This, this is what FEMA has as what they would term a long-term recovery program for properties that have been repetitively damaged and large payouts and claims have been made upon those properties. And rather than continue to make those types of claims, they make this funding available to stop paying out those claims over and over again. Yeah, Palooza Court is one of them. <laughs> correct. We've had some in Fairfield Harbor. That is correct. Mr. Chairman, yes. if I may ask, getting back to Commissioner Tyson's question that he asked you earlier, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, by raising this to whatever flood level that they're going to raise it, I mean, it, is it is it going to be adequate for uh, Hurricane Florence that came through, or because I, I let me just throw this in. Sure. I'm talking to a lot of Jones County people that were elevated uh, for Hurricane Floyd levels. Right. They're 14 foot in the air. It went three to four foot in the house now. Correct. So are we getting back into the same situation here with some of these? It could be very possible. The elevations are determined uh, through the partnership with the state of North Carolina and FEMA. It's a joint project. 
They're the ones that provide us with the maps. When we do our initial reviews, and we did do some initial reviews on those maps and provided a lot of input, and since then, the maps have been kind of put on hold. We've not had any further conversation other than they're saying they are looking at that. I think that they may delay the map implementation because the there's a lot of properties this time that were on the flood maps that were elevated properties and they got water in them. The houses that we had elevated, we only know of two houses. One was due to wave action and the other one, we're not sure whether or not there was some uh, components of the foundation that failed due to um, a wave or water pressure pushing against them. So uh, most of them fared pretty well. Did it get close to them? You better believe it. It was right at their floors in some instances, and some it was like within a foot of going in those structures. And we've not checked them. There's 130 out there. We've not checked all 130. We've just noticed as we were going through the hard hit neighborhoods where we had had some elevations, we went by and we just looked at those to see what we experienced. So we did, um, in some instances, like I said, one or two instances where we had uh, some problems, but it was due to things that weren't considered, like wave action. There was, you know, on the noose out there, there was probably times where there was, wind was blowing and there were six and eight foot waves on top of the floodwaters that were there, pounding one after the other. So. And one of the problems with this flood mapping also was they didn't consider Irene in there. <laughs> that is in correct. calculations, yeah. and that should have been in there. There are storms that weren't included, and we certainly have brought that out to the state, and uh, some other communities have as well, so we will see what... You know, when you're talking about this, a man came to me and he said, I think our water meters should be higher than what they are. And I said, like how high? So he said, well, at least five to six feet higher. I said, well, the problem is we don't know how high high is. I mean, if you take the storm on 54, it was what, 18 feet? Something like that? And well, this storm was 13 feet? You, I think the, the highest levels that we've kind of had uh, in Newburn Stillwater elevations has been somewhere around 12 feet. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure there was areas this time, if you were in an area subject to wave action, you probably had more water than that. And then some areas along the Trent River, for whatever reason, they had some higher elevations than what we had down in this area here. Uh, Steve was going up and down with his boat. <laughs> I think a fairly accurate estimate, Don, is going to be Davis Suggs' house mm -hmm. because of uh, where he's located. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be an accurate, you know, fairly accurate estimate. And I think it was uh, probably. 11, 11, 6 maybe there. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that because he's really on Lake Claremont. Sure. And Lake Claremont became part of the Trent River mm -hmm. uh, through Scott Creek and maybe Matamore's Lane to some degree. But the Trent River. Yeah, I don't think you had any wave action there like you did in some areas because right. it's. Okay, do we have a vote to approve the contract awarded as recommended in order to move forward with the proposed activities on this program? The motion? Oh, you've already done that. We did? Oh, okay. All in favor say aye. aye. <laughs> Nays, the ayes have it. Got lost, but it never hurts. The problem matters soil conservation 2018 stream debris removal. I told Patrick earlier he's probably going to be. Uh, Snagging creeps till he retires, so right. yeah. after this storm. <laughs> Good well, evening. I think him snagging the creeps helped a lot. <laughs> uh, we, we sure hope so. At least we've heard some of that. Yeah. Well, I was going to come in here and say I hate to crash the Florence party with a Matthew party, but that's why we were here. And uh, Hurricane Florence has crashed our Hurricane Matthew party. Uh, we're going to start here. I figured, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, so if I give you all a thousand pictures, I should be able to get out of here without saying anything. <laughs> Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is skip just a couple of slides. Uh, all right. These, this here shows what you're seeing. The, the creek shown in blue are the ones that we had under the Golden Leaf uh, funding. And the one shown in red was under the state disaster funding. So this is what we were operating off of this year. 
Now, as far as what's been completed, state disaster, the areas in red have been completed. That's about 23 miles. The areas in blue are still in process. They hadn't been completed yet. You know, right, and then now Florence has hit, so it's kind of thrown us in a little bit of a, what do we do now? So it's still about 29 miles of the state disaster areas. Uh, now the Golden Leaf projects, uh, out of 56.4 miles of them were already completed, and we've got just a little section about two and a half miles long in Swift Creek that's left to be done from that. So that's where we'll start now. Unfortunately, it looks like Hurricane Florence has probably undone a lot of what we've done this last year. However, the good thing is on the creeks that were completed, we were about as ready for this storm as we could be. And I'm going to go back now to my other pictures here. This is a section of Little Swift Creek, and this was taken the day before the hurricane, before Florence came. That's just an example of how good of a job he did. Now, this next picture was taken this morning. Same area, same view. And it's already filled back up, so at least in that section. So that's an example of what we're going to be facing now. Now, the state, they're already asking questions. Uh, tell us what you need as far as money. we need to reevaluate these things. And, and they actually wanted some of that due by tomorrow. Well, you know, today was my first day back in regular duties as not doing disaster supply and all that <coughs> stuff. And we told them, I just can't meet that deadline by tomorrow. So they, they said, that'll be fine. Get it to us just as soon as you can. So we're going to be working on that. So anyway, that's just an example of what we're facing out there right now. But we've already heard words from people that said, you know, the water came up. It flooded the road, but then it went right back out. So that's some of the good things. Now, look, we'll just flip through. Uh, let's start right here. This is some examples of the, some of the work completed. Now, this one is in the Upper Broad Creek, you know, splits Craven and Pamlico County. This is a before shot showing the crew working. After shot, we're going to have several of these before, after. And these are, these are some big logs. Now, I, we sat there and watched these guys work, and uh, it, it, you really put it into perspective as to what they go through in trying to get these things out. So that's the before and after. Same thing before, after. Now, this is uh, in the upper reaches of Bachelor Creek. Uh, we didn't get many before pictures here, but you can see some of the areas that he's, he was working in where he's cut some of the tops, some of the log ends this shows you that we are out there working now this is uh this is some of the conditions uh and this that day was jason frederick and myself from the planning department so we we had to have a break this was some rough it was a rough day uh this is an issue we see in bachelor creek this is an infestation of non-native invasive alligator weed and it is just about taking that creek over uh, here's an example of us trying to get through it. Now the creek here goes from here all the way over here. It should be one open body of water. Wow. But it's all alligator weed now. So that's something for the future. Because the alligator weed is such that if it breaks loose and floats downstream and catches on the bank, it will sprout right there and grow there as well. Isn't there a grant program for alligator weed? There is. The state has a program for spraying. And some, of, some counties up in the northeast part of the state do that. And they kind of do a cost share program with the counties where the county will go out and spray and turn in their receipts and the state will give them back half of the money for the spraying. Uh, this is some more examples of trees, some of the things he was dealing with in Bachelor Creek. One of the after shots coming down. We try to get out there and look at every foot of it if we can. Is this kind of south, I guess it would be, south of the, uh, the Highway 70 or is this? Which uh, side of 70? We're on yeah. both sides of 70. Okay, so yeah. you're working both? Yes, sir. We went from the, on Bachelor Creek, we went from the uh, Jones Craven County line all the way down to 43, where it crosses uh, the Washington Post Road, I guess is what it's called. Okay. Yeah. Marvin Reed. Yeah. I, I did that creek one time, kayaking. Pretty, pretty well, last week, you know, two weeks ago, you could have went all the way through it. But yeah, I don't I know about now. I up with some beaver dams a couple of years ago when I did it. Mm -hmm. And we're working on that, too, the other side of it is the beaver trapping. This is the guys working. Uh, this is in Fisher Swamp off of Little Swift Creek. And you can see this is hand labor. There's nothing glorious about this at all. 
Uh, this is where they came through a section of the creek, and they sometimes they go through and they have to mark the, the channel because sometimes water's high and they can't see it, so they can through and mark it the best they can. Another example, just manual labor. Uh, this was uh, the name of the creek has left me, but it's right there off of Wildlife Road in Bridgeton. Goes down to the river. Uh, anyway, we went out to the river on it and worked. Now this is an example. We want to show you all the good things, but there we do come across problems out here sometimes. It's just like any other project, you're gonna have issues arise. And we had one issue arise with one group of contractors. And uh, they just for some reason they just could not seem to do what they were supposed to do. And this particular creek here, this is off of uh, Core Creek, one of the branches that runs up to Asbury Road, and, and I had to go back to that section out and dropped that in right. the bottom of the creek, and it was hidden until the water went down and then it exposed it. So needless to say, this guy had to end up getting rid of this contractor, the guys that he had working. So that's some of the things, you know, this is the ugly side. We see it, things don't always work right, but I guess what I want to focus on with you guys is that we hold their feet to the fire and nobody gets paid until they do the job the way they're supposed to. Uh, another example, this is, where he's cut debris out of the, here's the stream here, and he's cut the debris. He's supposed to pull it back at least 20 feet from the bank so that it don't fall back in there. And you see that's right on the bank. Right. Now, it's one thing if this log was 10 foot long and 4,000 pounds, but this is firewood size stuff here. There's no reason why they couldn't have thrown that back. So, of course, we came back in, marked it with paint, and he called us up and he said, okay, I've been back through there and I got it. And when I went back to check it again, here's the same logs with the same paint still on it. So, and there again, this is when the guy got rid of them and got a, another crew in. Joint effort between us and the planning department. This is uh, Jason Frederick and Chad. Got old Chad in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I like to call this Lewis and Clark right here. So, so it is a multi-department <laughs> effort. I can't, hadn't got Don, Don out there the yet. I hadn't got him out there yet. <laughs> I'm going after him as soon as I get Gene. <laughs> so, all right, so now they went through a creek one day. You know, this is, we were doing 111 miles of creeks. That's a lot of stuff, and, and I can't cover it all. So that's why we send these guys in. And they went in, went through this creek. The guy said he was done, so they were going to go through and inspect it. They said, no, he's not done. They started marking stuff, and... Two weeks later, you know, I, t I get it with him, look, they've marked stuff, you need to go back through there and get it again. So two weeks later, he says, okay, I got it all out, went in there. So me and Jason go back behind them again. And what do we find? There's the stuff with the same paint that was on there two weeks earlier. They have not been through. Same thing here, orange paint. And this is obvious stuff. You know, I, I, what I did is I take pictures of it and I send it to the, the main contractor and I said, look, Here's what we found, the same stuff is still there. And we tell them, look, we're not nitpicking you. This is a whole log, and there's the paint. So yeah. your guys didn't go through there. Then, there again, this is the crew that ended up getting rid of them. So. But we held them to it. Same thing, just more stuff that they left. Big logs right in the middle of the creek. So now, he, he gets rid of that crew and brings in another crew. And what these guys do is they go out here not only did they go through there and get it, but they documented it with pictures. The before and the after, giving us the thumbs up. We got it, you know. So this guy, and you see, he's, he's nearly neck deep in that water yeah, right sure there. Uh, there's nothing glorious about it. Same thing here. How many snakes are you seeing in this? Uh, I've got a section on that coming up. <laughs> but to answer that question, the, one of the first days I went out, I lost count of the track of snakes. There were so many. And then there's days you go out and you don't see anything. Then there's days you go out and you see maybe three or four, but they're huge, like they're the big ones that you don't want to step on. So anyway, they go through, like I said, that's a before and an after, showing us exactly what they've gotten. Now this is, uh, we're moving on now to the Golden Leaf Project. This is, I think this one's Flat Swamp. This is two days before Florence. And so what I was focusing on here is you can see all the way up that creek, just as far as you can see. That's pretty work, he did good. <clears throat> Same thing, this is Core Creek. 
I personally have never seen Coral Creek that low where I was looking at, where I was taking that picture. And this was about two days before the storm. Uh, this is, this is Swift Creek. All right. Oh, let me go ahead. Here's an example of a falling, this is a root at the bottom of a tree that's blown over in the creek. So we'll be out there walking around, working, and what you don't see is I want you to focus right here. Ooh. I'm going to zoom in on that just a little bit here in the next slide. There he is. So you see, you'll be standing there working, looking, walking around, and you never see him until the last minute. But that, that's not a moccasin. Yeah, that is a cottonmouth water moccasin right there. Now, I'm going to show you. He comes down here, comes around here. He wraps right on around in here. You see this brown strip? Wow, he is that, huge. That's he a is. telltale sign of a cottonmouth water moccasin right there, that brown stripe that runs right through his eyes. So that's just your snake lesson for the day. So that's one example. All right. So now when me and Jason, that day we, we had to stop and take a break. And we were sitting there. We got ready to go again. He got ready to, to grab his boat. And right in here, he got ready to grab it. And then certain words come out of his mouth. And he was like, man, there is a snake right there by my head. And you see, he's getting his phone right now to take a picture of that snake. And as he's talking, I look down. And in this bush right here, I want you to look right here. I never saw him. I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit here, too. Boom. There he was. And we've been standing there for 10 minutes. Never saw him. To the next one. He gets out of his phone. Uh, well, he, he should he, be getting out his gun. I know. <laughs> yeah, we'll cover that one in a, <laughs> another meeting. Uh, Anyway, right here, this was a stopping point, and what you can't see, I mean, just innocent little nasty creek bottom, and right over in here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in again here on this stump. All right, still can't quite see him, but you're gonna focus right in here. And I'm gonna zoom in on him one more time. Boom, there he is. He's sitting there ready, ready for business. <laughs> but you see, that's where he's at. We, we walked around this area and never saw him. And then all of a sudden you look over there and there he is. What is the contingency plan for a snake bite in a remote? I mean, it, how long did it well, take you get from there to civilization? Well, see, now this was where one of our problems, we were talking about it, and we said, you know, you, like that area right there, it took us a good hour and a half to get there to where we're at. And you get bit by a snake, then you're supposed to not panic. How in the world are you supposed to do that? So, I mean, me, me and him have decided, you know, it, it's, sometimes you think it's just a matter of time before it happens. And I said, well, we're just going to have a little prayer session and get out just as quick as we can. So We, we ended up making provisions to get them a radio. That's right. That they can call for help and either get extracted from a helicopter or whatever. Yeah. That is the best with where they are. That's right. We, we did, and I'm glad you said that because I had forgot about it. That, that was one of the things now they have got us some communications that will work whether we've got a cell phone signal or not. So I still hadn't got the helicopter I've been asking for, but you know, that could eliminate a lot of this. Uh, it's another example. Now this was just a limb that we marked because the whole creek channel comes from here to here and all we really want them to do here is to trim out the limbs that's touching the, the uh, water. Well, you see the paint right here. So you go up in there and put the paint on it. This is where they really get you. I'm going to zoom in on that limb a little bit. I don't know if you can still see him or not. Right up in here. I'm going to zoom in on him one more time. Boom. And there he is from the head to the tail. But that's, you know, sitting back looking at it, you never see it until you roll up in there, and there he is. So. Uh... Another big boy. Movie. That was Bachelor Creek. He was he was grown. And that's kind of just a nutshell version of uh, how the about, string of bread. How about the G word? Do you ever see any of those? I got to go through my list of G words. Gator that's word. North Carolina gator. for alligator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have been looking and I have not seen a gator yet. Right, now, good. one of the contractors told me he has seen one in Swift Creek just above 118 Bridge, but I have not seen him yet. Hadn't seen Bigfoot, been looking for him too. 
<laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, lately some of the contractors, they've been calling, hey, what's the deal? What, what are we going to do about the new stuff? And I said, well, right now we're in recovery mode and just stay tuned. But I know the state, they're interested in knowing what kind of extra damage we've got, and, and I'd like to let them know. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to evaluate it, but so. Well, you know, we put this program in seven years ago, and I think this has helped a lot, especially in Jason's uh, area and my area with mm -hmm. uh, Little Swift Creek and Swift Creek. And uh, it's been a good program, and uh, we want to thank you, Patrick, for what yes, you've sir. done with this yes, and getting sir. us the right grants and the fund that we started for it All right. and uh, the dangers that you guys face. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the report. All right. Go. Okay, finance, human resources. Mr. Finance Director. Good evening, uh, Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, we know what Patrick's request is going to be like uh, during the next budget session. <laughs> Lots of snake bite and helicopter rides. Um, at our last board meeting, it was discussed the staff would uh, bring forth a plan to pay out overtime to employees who worked above and beyond their normal working hours as a part of the county's response to Hurricane Florence. Uh, the county so far has had approximately 200 employees who have incurred a total of 8,427 overtime hours before, during, and immediately following the storm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this equates to approximately $200,000 in benefits, in, in compensation and benefits. Uh, these, these were mandatory hours that were required to operate our EOC, the shelters, and other facilities throughout these events. Uh, currently, the county personnel policy provides employees comp time for the hours worked over 40 in a pay period, pay period instead of overtime compensation and would require the board's approval in order to make this accommodation. At this time, management would like to request the approval from the board to compensate non-exempt county employees who incurred overtime as a result of the county's response to Hurricane Florence with overtime compensation instead of comp time. Uh, this would be limited only to overtime hours worked during the time period of September 11th to October 6th. Um, this overtime is uh, currently a, a FEMA reimbursable expense that we would intend to go after through the PA program. Okay. So are there any questions? I'm available. Uh, Amber Parker, Human Resources uh, Director, is available. Yes. Well. I do have a question. Um, explain non-exempt employees. Uh, non-exempt em employees would be employees that, uh, through the um, uh, Fair Labor and Standards Act, are determined uh, they're paid on an hourly basis. So exempt would be salary employees like myself and the management team. So this would be limited only to those who are considered okay. non-exempt or hourly. Okay. Any other questions? Have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, do we need a roll call vote on this? Yes, roll sir. call vote, please. Okay. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McKay? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Vice Chair Dacey? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appointments? Nope, the mosquito uh, what did spray. I miss? Spring. Spring. Mosquito spring. Oh, yes. Mosquito spring. There you go. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. I come to you this evening to uh, request a, a budget amendment for some uh, special funding we received for mosquito abatement from the state in the amount of $173,899. And we have put together a plan that I think fits our county fairly well. It's a combination of things from anything from larva side to providing our municipalities with uh, the chemical they need to do spraying. They say that they already have the equipment and the manpower. Uh, the municipalities use different uh, chemicals, so we'll, we'll probably buy, or, or if, if they approve, uh, purchase several uh, uh, different chemicals. I know that. Uh, our county manager, Mr. Bight, has been speaking with the city managers, uh, and uh, they seem open to uh, spraying outside of their normal spray areas to cover some areas uh, for us. Uh, and also, um, building in two sprayers to set up in some some trucks that are already county uh, county vehicles, and 
basically this is less expensive than totally contracting out and also give us the capacity in the future in events like this uh, or other, others we may see necessary. So uh, if you look at it in total, um, that portion of it, the uh, larva side, uh, the material for the municipalities, the equipment and the material for us to uh, locally contract, um, then you would probably have, I'm, I'm saying roughly uh, about 45,000 acres worth of aerial spraying as well. So it would be a combination of larvicide, truck spraying, and aerial spraying. And I would leave the uh, selections for aerial spraying to, to the experts. I have uh, an in-house expert with uh, Ray Silverthorne, and I also have Mr. Jeff Hottenstein of Clark Mosquito Control. He's also uh, been talking with us as well. And they, they both say that uh, this combination plan of truck and aerial and larva side would be a good way to approach our county. At this time, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions and have these, my, my subject matter experts here as well. Um, would you, would you, I, I would move approval of the budget amendment. Yeah. Second. Okay. Discussion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the larva side, you're going to spray a larva side as well as the, what is the other one, the insecticide or whatever you call it? The larva side would actually be two things, the mosquito dumps and also some pellets that uh, um, um, Mr. Hartenstein had, had uh, told us about the last longer, basically for 60 days, I believe. So, I mean, so it's not a spray, it's, it's a, it's that's a right. no, okay. And that's yeah. something that our water department uh, staff could, could do when they're out in the field and, and also some things that we could hand out to the homeowners for, you know, when they have standing water they just can't get rid of. All right, and we had a pretty good in-depth conversation on mosquitoes last week. And, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, um, the, the spray, what is the communication between the spray that you put out if it is hazardous to bees or any other species of, because, uh, uh, you know, birds, birds, or anything else? Mr. Hottenstein. My name is Jeff Hottenstein. Um, basically, when you're, what you're going to do when you spray is you're going to target the mosquitoes when they're most active, which is primarily after dusk and before daylight. So you're not gonna be spraying when the bees are mainly active. Um, the product that we are recommending is a product called Duet. There is actually a recent study uh, from Louisiana State University that was in cooperation with um, their Department of Agriculture, LSU, and the beekeepers and mosquito control locally in that area where they devised a, a way of looking at mosquito control applications done on a regular basis to see if there was an increase in bee mortality in the hives locally. And what they found was there was no adverse effect or a larger increase based upon mosquito control activities in the Baton Rouge area of Louisiana, which is sprayed on a pretty regular basis. There's a lot of exposure. So that's, that's the product that we're recommending for this. It also breaks down in about 24 hours. This is synthetic pyrethroid. It has an agitator called pralethrin that gets mosquitoes that are resting up and flying, increasing the basically overall effect by getting mosquitoes that would normally not be impacted by a spray up and flying. So that's the benefit of doing it that way. Mr. Chairman, if I can follow up. So the, the mosquitoes that you're, you're going to be spraying near dusk, mm -hmm. is that what you said? The mosquitoes species that are active during the day, does it, does it impact them? Yes. What will happen is it will get them up and flying. There were studies done by Rutgers University that um, showed spraying even at 2 a.m. Um, affected the Asian tiger mosquito, which is commonly uh, the most active daytime biter that you have. Um, obviously, cleaning up a property and, and larviciding with the tablets or dunks in an area that would normally, um, that you can't tip over, like a rain barrel or something like that, is, is the best way. But um, a combination of the two would do that, and it would reduce the overall number of adults that 
uh, would be bothering and affecting the workers trying to clean up, homeowners trying to clean up their property and, and the like. Um, you know, right now you're probably going to be looking at anywhere between 15 and 25 different species of mosquitoes coming off after this um, after this hurricane event. So you're going to be looking at huge amounts. Um, hence the aerial application in certain areas. Mr. Chair, you you saying that you only spray certain areas? Where you spray come? Where, where are you going to spray at? <coughs> what spray? Yeah, you think some uh, area spray? Aerial spray, yeah. 45,000 acres is going to be in areas that aren't covered by the, the truck spraying that's going to be done. Am, right. am I correct? That's correct. Okay. So the municipalities would spray their municipalities. Uh, two contract drivers with these two sprayers we're going to purchase with the chemical would be out spraying uh, the area that the municipalities wouldn't buy truck. And then uh, we're going to pick out 45,000 acres roughly. To, to do aerial spraying where it really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to do truck spraying. So that means that you are not have no trucks down in the hollow area, just the area spray? No, sir, not necessarily. There, there could be trucks as well. Okay, I've spoken with, I mean, I don't want to put any municipality on the spot, but I did talk to Havelock about spraying Harlow, and they've agreed in principle, we don't, I mean, we don't have an agreement with them. They've agreed to handle the roadside, but Scott, because like you're saying, there's some areas of Harlow that would be better served by aerial spraying and some areas that would be better by truck spraying. And there would be some areas where we'll use tablets as well as one of the other applications as a larvicide. And I think with this plan, that 173000 we could get coverage throughout the county, everywhere. When, when are your parents starting this? We would love to start it this week. If it gets approved uh, tomorrow, tonight, better. Yeah, that's I mean, I know everybody. If everybody wants some relief, then I think oh, we, we, we could we definitely. Behind this. It's some things in place this week. Okay, so I see somebody in the Hollow area this this week. Oh well, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> Got a big right. county there, fella. Yeah, I know, big county. <laughs> everybody got. You don't have mosquitoes. Uh, and I, Ray, Ray is reminding me, we would also like for people in the area who would not like spraying to give the health department a call, and the people who would like spraying to give the health department a call. We like spraying. Yes, because that will help us in some of the FEMA reimbursement if we, we get to that stage. And uh, so that's just basically calling the health department and giving us a yes or, or no. I think we'll get a whole lot of yeses. Thank you. Yes, sir. No, no, Mr. Chairman, yes. say what you just said again now, make sure that we understand it. <laughs> yes. To get yes. the FEMA reimbursement to, to insure it, you need correspondence is what you're asking for. Is that why? I, the more documentation, the better. And if we have documentation of excessive mosquitoes while people are trying to get back into their homes, work on their homes, that will also assist us in, in some reimbursement. That probably is the whole county. <laughs> You want to say, uh, since we're on camera here and there may be millions of people watching, you want to say your phone number so the public will know who to call? Well, we can do the, the main number, 636-4920. That'll, that'll get you to the phone. 636-4920. Uh, what if we established a Twitter handle for this particular issue and we have people utilize Twitter to say that they need this? Either that or we could work with IP and probably set up an online database, which may even be better because it would capture the actual what address is of the Oh, uh, I thought we were going to do this by community and municipality. <laughs> no, this is, well, yes, but this is to get the public input that Scott's looking for. And I'm just trying to figure out some way to quickly do this if we could. Well, I, I still think it would have to be done by the community. Uh, let, let us put our heads together. I think there's a couple options. Scott's yeah. got a great team of PIOs and health educators that probably have some great ideas on that. So. I'm calling right now, so you know. <laughs> 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 oh, <boy>. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we have a motion and we have a second. Yeah. Uh, we need a roll call vote on this? Yes. 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 Okay. Commissioner Thanks, Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McKay? You know I'm going to say yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Oh, yes. boy. Vice Chair Dacey? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now let's go to appointments.
yesterday if I want to get how I want to ask. Pending <laughs> appointments. Whew. Adult Care Home Advisory Committee, four vacancies. Emergency Medical Service Advisory, one vacancy. Do we have anything for the medical emergency? Nope. Nursing home, we have one vacancy. That's up to the uh, card. Current appointments, Craven County Board of Adjustment. The board will be requested to nominate from MCAS Cherry Point Zoning Area and Craven Regional Airport Zoning Area. We discussed this at last session, but that was before the storm, I believe. It uh, was before the storm. And uh, uh, I do have one person. You, uh, have, one, you have one person? Yes. And, and I, I think I'll ask Steve to get the other one if he get into it. Airport. That's George Lana. Do you have you have an application okay, that's for the them? Board of Adjustment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I don't have my. Uh, well, who? Steve, you want to you want to let George Hanna since since in have a lot? Let him get the other one. No. No. Okay. No, the one I, you I say that only about. because the airport is up in his yeah. district. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about three. Well, that's what I say. One from him and one from yeah. down in Right. Army. So he I have his, mine. His uh, uh, Robert Rose. All right, we'll we'll bring it back up uh, uh, next, next, uh, next uh, day meeting. Okay. Thank you. And Steve will work on his. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll pick somebody. Okay. And the next is upcoming appointments. So we're finished with appointments. County manager's report. Would you like the attorney to go first, sir? Yeah, I mean, that'd be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I got such a riveting report. I know you can't wait. session too. Yeah. Let me skip the commission report. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, I actually have two items this evening. The first is in your agenda packet. Uh, the county has received an offer to purchase uh, property that the county and the town of Dover uh, own on 110 North Company Street uh, out in Dover. This was the uh, result of a tax foreclosure sale. Um, the offer is for $2,500. Um, you know, the uh, tax foreclosure amount was $3,910, and the tax value is $10,000. Um, this is the beginning of the process. The town of Dover has uh, approved um, the offer. Uh, if the board approves it tonight, we will put the property out for bid and see what happens and bring back the final. I bid uh, to you gentlemen for uh, approval um, after the town of Dover has a crack at it. So, uh, assuming you would like to move forward, we would need a motion and a second and a vote to. Um, Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, the second item, not uh, on your agenda, but does uh, involve the uh, recent storm. As the board is aware, um, throughout Hurricane Florence and after uh, the storm, <coughs> the chairman um, entered uh, a series of declarations of states of emergency, and uh, those have been uh, extended and modified throughout the process. The um, current state of emergency actually expires uh, tonight at midnight. Um, the last extension uh, was, I don't know, a week or so ago, Tuesday. Jack, Tuesday. Um, the board has two options. If you do nothing, the state of uh, emergency will um, naturally expire uh, and be over. Um, although um, I think a second option would be good for the board, and that is to actually further extend the state of emergency. There are um, resources uh, presently uh, in the county and uh, other items that are available to the county and the citizens which are contingent on um, a state of emergency. Um, there certainly is no downside to continue in the state of emergency. I think my thought um, and perhaps Jack, Jack's thought is let's just continue it until uh, the next commissioner's meeting. Uh, we can revisit it again, but that's probably a time uh, that we could um, let it expire. We would uh, really hate for the um, county or any citizens to miss out on any resources because we let the state of emergency prematurely expire. So it's my recommendation that uh, uh, you, um, by motion and second and vote, um, ask the chairman to uh, extend the state of emergency until the next meeting. 
Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Nays, the ayes have it. That concludes my report. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity tonight. Um, I normally give you an update of my uh, two-week uh, agenda of meetings I've been to and things like that. Um, I'm sorry tonight it's going to be mainly Hurricane Florence, and I wanted to update you on where the county's at, different programs we have going on, and some statistics and things I find interesting that, that you might want to know. The first thing I'll start with is um, we mentioned tonight, and I'm going to hold it up for Bob. We do have the uh, FEMA line that was mentioned to the board. It is still active, and you still need to register if you've not done so. Uh, it's a very important asset on getting uh, citizens help. You heard from the FEMA folks, so I'm going to go light on that. I don't think you probably need a, anything that I could give you there. Um, second, I want to talk to you about damage assessment. We are rapidly um, close to finishing that, if not already finished at the end of the day. I did receive a final report or a final report for the day. Just to give you a perspective, this would be the county assessment along with the city of Newburn, which will give you the whole countywide damage. We've had to merge those two together. As of now, 301 commercial structures received damage at a tune of $30,001,000. We had a total of 4,658 residential structures at this time that are reported to have damage at a total of $165,946,600. For a countywide total of all structures, 4,959. $195,947,600. What was that last piece, The last one was 40 what, Jack? 4,959 total structures, both commercial and residential. Okay. Total of $195,947,600. It is a astounding figure to me, quite frankly. Um, and I, I don't believe that's a, a whole picture yet. I'd like to see the end of today. Obviously, I didn't get today's. This was about noon time when I got this report. I suspect we'll be right at the 200 million plus uh, perspective countywide. So I think the needs there, you guys have been out in your communities. I've, I've seen you, I've been out with you. Um, it's hard to describe what folks are going through and what our county looks like, but there, there are some positives uh, I'm seeing too. So that's certainly keeping me uh, on the right path. So I want to talk to you a little bit about debris pickup. Um, we do have two sites currently open. We call these DMS. These are sites that are mainly for the governmental units and the con uh, commercial contractors. Those are at Creekside Park and at the Old Craven 30 site, which I've been told is now to be referred to as the West Newburn community. Uh, Warehouser was very generous to the county to allow us to use that site. Um, I'm very thankful for that because we, we had a site at International Paper near the factory uh, up on um, Warehouser Road, and we, we unfortunately couldn't come to terms on that, but, but Warehouser stepped in and, and did what they did for us. Uh, Gene had some updated figures this afternoon. Those sites are being well used. If you happen to ride by, you'll certainly see a mountain of vegetative debris. So it's vegetative only at those sites. Our seven convenience site locations have uh, maintained uh, additional days and hours over the last two-week period. We had referred that to you in some of our briefings we had, some of our emergency meetings we had or excuse me, special call meetings we had last week and the week before. Um, I went and visited a couple of the sites. I know Gene's visited some, and I'm sure you visited some. They, they were certainly overwhelmed with the response of materials they received, particularly on the C&D side. Um, at Manette's site on Saturday, it was certainly, a, you, could, you could barely find the box. I mean, it was mounded up. Our contractor's doing a good job when we, we ramp the site down at the end of the day, starting to pack that material into boxes and work it as close as they can. Um, we're certainly getting a lot of white goods, scrap metal, uh, trash, recyclables, the whole nine yards. I mean, the sites are certainly being well used, uh, and we think that'll continue for some time um, to do that. The board did choose to waive uh, for household uh, solid waste, basically everything in a white bag, through the end of the week uh, of the trash sticker program. That is not being accepted at this time. After Friday, it will certainly start back. We think by that time, everyone should have cleaned out their fridge and um, had that material either in their normal trash can or at the site. I am pleased to report that all the household municipal solid waste routes are being ran. Um, they started last week. And as of today, the recycling routes are being ran again. And a lot of folks, there was some confusion about why recycling wasn't being ran. It's because the factory, or the MRF as they're called, the sorting facility was damaged in Jacksonville, had no power. That site was brought back up late last week and this weekend. And they are um, certainly collecting materials and being able to take them there, a contractor. 
Uh, let's see. Contractor pickup. Our contractor, Phillips and Jordan, is out. There are quite a few municipalities that have partnered off of um, our contract that are receiving those services. As I mentioned earlier, when the FEMA folks were talking, uh, DOT will have a contractor to pick C&D and vegetative and uh, white goods appliances from the state right of ways. We will cover everything that's on a private road. Uh, we are asking for Fairfield Harbor and are close to that decision to, to go into the gated community and take care of that. And we're also, you'll see your municipalities using our contract to pick up in their areas. I know I've seen pickups in Riverbend, uh, New Bern, Trent Woods, I believe even the town of Vanceboro are, had, a, had a pickup there. So we'll mention that. Um, so I'll, I'll stop with that. Are there any questions on debris? I know that's something you're probably getting a lot of feedback from. There are going to be. Go ahead. Are there going to be multiple passes through on debris? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They're flagging things as they go along. They pick it up, then sending their runners back to take another look. So. And we're also monitoring that as well. And there was a lot of <coughs> leftover stuff. Right. So I guess it would be incumbent upon us to try to gather it into a larger pile again. Um, <coughs> yes, sir. And make it easier for them to pick up. Absolutely. And I, I've had to tell folks, and I know there's angst about the, the pile of debris in front of a person's home. Uh, this is certainly a marathon, not a sprint. The degree of debris, both C and D and vegetative, is overwhelming in our county. Uh, I've been in most of the areas. I mean, I, I know the need. I think what will help a lot but will be when DOT gets out and starts picking up the right-of-ways. That's something that hasn't been done yet. Uh, as far as I understand, Mr. Grady or Gene, I believe they're working on a contract should be pretty, getting pretty close, I think. There was, oh, okay, at that. Any other questions on debris? No. Okay, county building update, uh, remediation process is ending. We have done some emergency things to our buildings, just like a lot of people are doing their homes. We've had remediation companies in almost when the wind quit, stopped blowing, uh, they were there on site. First project was pumping out the Sally Port underneath the Emergency Operations Center. That was certainly something we didn't anticipate. Uh, I can tell you uh, from being in the center that night, it was awfully eerie watching the river come through. Uh, I see Chairman Mark shaking his head. That was a bizarre experience. There's a lot of lessons learned. One of them is that the fuel pump for the generator shouldn't be in the sally port. That's how you get fuel to the generator on the roof that runs the building. So we, we uh, had a lot of excitement with that. Um, I'll, I'll just start with the biggest fix and go to the smallest. The convention center, as you're well aware, is fenced off. That's for the safety of the public. We are uh, finishing remediation there. It did sustain substantial damage. Uh, my estimate's 12 months plus on recovery. I would like the board to consider at this time, while we've already had to tear out most of the carpet, if not all, and most of the sheetrock, it would certainly be a good time to readdress the floor situation, uh, the settlement issues that we've had for some time. Mr. Hodges is working on a proposal to get a uh, engineering firm in to take a look. We probably need to do another scan to see exactly what we have. I'll probably bring something like that to your next meeting so you can consider that. A scan is a starting point because it shows you where we were after we finished the project and where we are now so we can compare the settlement there. Uh, Mary Harris and her team has worked, uh, Mary McGee and her team has worked very hard on talking to our clients. Just today we, we've spoken with the TDA. Uh, they want to take a role in trying to help uh, clients who may not be served by the convention center find other venues. I think that's a great role for them. Uh, they're excited about that. Mary will be working closely with their executive director who's just coming on board, sort of work in partnership to, to find other locations and really help our caterers and partners out that have been there with us the whole time to make sure uh, they have a chance at that business. Uh, County admin building, you're here tonight. You see that there's quite a bit of extra materials in the hallways and it's a little warmer than it should be. We did suffer because of water, some HVAC unit failure. Um, we do have portable units in that's keeping it bearable for us to be here. Um, and that's, you know, a month's long process to replace those units. Both of them just happen to be relatively new. We had replaced one of them a couple years ago and one of them last year. So one of them's under warranty and one of them's not. So we're certainly working with insurance and things like that um, to bring those units back on. Otherwise, this building had some, as you see, there's a piece of sheetrock out there, ceiling tile over there little onesie twosie type things, um, but those are being remedied by our maintenance department. There are a couple offices down in the finance department that are gonna have to receive a more extensive um, remediation along with an office in our elections uh, department. The USC courthouse I referenced to you earlier re did receive some significant flooding in the first level, which is the Sally Port and the basement of the old courthouse. 
Um, that is a, a large fix. We did um, have some trouble with the elevator there that transports folks from the Sally Port up into the building. That is a long-term fix based on parts. We are uh, working with the Sheriff's Department on that. We know that's a priority for them, and uh, we will try to address that as, as we move forward. As I mentioned the fuel pump to you. Uh, when the mitigation guy was there, I, I wanted to ask him if that could be the first project that we work on, moving that somewhere outside of the Sally Port, because that is an essential part of our operation. We also have a mattress office in that area. It received extensive damage. Those folks have relocated out to our Clarks Road facility uh, indefinitely until we can uh, resolve that issue with them. Clerk of Court Records Room received damage. We helped with the remediation of files that were located there. We feel very strongly that we were able to save all the documents. If there, there was a process which they had to be treated. And there's also two sets of uh, bathrooms there that are, going, that are closed right now to the public. And they're using other additional restrooms in the facility. And lastly, the HVAC units, heating and mm -hmm. cooling, things that were in the Sally Porter and areas on that first floor are having to be remediated. So we're working along on that. Have a lot mattress office. We thought initially they, there may have been water in. It doesn't seem that it was that bad. However, there are some roof issues there that we're addressing. You know, that holds a DMV office, a magistrate, social service uh, employees. Um, so we're working on that. And then finally, just broad base, there's miscellaneous repairs at all our county facilities. You know, again, ceiling tiles, windows, things like that, um, that we're, our maintenance staff is working very hard to bring back. It's in, uncomfortable in places where you may have you know, piece of a wall missing, but we're working through and, and, and trying to work together to get that done. I am getting some reports about the Newman Library. Uh, I'll be speaking with Commissioner Dacey since he serves on that board. We work at the library, and there are some issues there that we need to consider. Um, so I'll, I'll just follow up with you at the next meeting on that. Um, so that's all for county buildings. Any questions on that part? Okay. Shelter, we are down to one shelter, and I want to thank the City of Newburn for allowing us and working with the Red Cross to use the West Newburn Recreation Center on Pine Tree. Uh, Commissioner Tyson and others have been by there. I was there over the weekend. Uh, great group of folks in that shelter. Uh, great <coughs> attitudes. These are folks who've been in a shelter, some of them for pushing three weeks now. Um, certainly anything that the community does for them is appreciated. Uh, I can tell you that they really enjoy uh, those type of things. I, got, I do have good news to report. Red Cross has been working very closely with the tenants in the shelter and we are now down to 75 folks in that shelter from uh, 140 just a couple nights ago. What the Red Cross does is they come in with caseworkers and individually work with each citizen that's in there, try to work on a plan to some more permanent temporary type housing. Uh, so they've been successful um, down to 75. I will tell you the high point was sometime on Friday, immediately following the storm, we were uh, over 1,500 people that we were sheltering. So roughly 1% uh, of our population was in a county shelter, put that in perspective for you. Uh, let's see, FEMA, we talked about that. I do want to give a few more specifics on a couple things. We do have a disaster recovery center open at the old Rite Aid building on DeGraff and Reed Road, beside McDonald's, close to the Piggly Wiggly. Best way to describe it. Um, in the way, V, between the- way to steer yeah. people there. They are um, open, they have a lot of staff. Gene and I went with them before they opened and did a briefing. Uh, great gr bunch of folks, most of them 10, 15 years experience. Some of them just coming from Hawaii, from the volcano issue they had there. Uh, lots of different resources, as you saw tonight, just the, the folks that were here. A lot of different things that citizens can, can, can take advantage of there. Uh, that is open 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., seven days a week. So that facility will go on to further notice. I got word, Commissioner Liner, uh, Commissioner McCabe, at 5 p.m. today that uh, the Havelock site has been approved. And Commissioner Liner, I'm going to have to give, get you to give me a better <coughs> description of what that building's called. It's a... It's a whole, the old Havelock Auto Sales. Right near Slocum Gate. Right, right, right across from Slocum Gate. Okay, that facility was approved. Got to go up to Wendy's at that light, make a right-hand turn, and then make another right-hand turn, come down the service road. Okay, it's always the end of the service road. Mm -hmm. There are some modifications the county will be required to make to meet FEMA guidelines for ADA. Uh, Gene has already got that list, and he'll be working on it first thing in the morning. I understand that once they give the approval, when we get started work, they'll start mobilizing to come, and that'll put some, take some pressure off the Newburn facility and also allow for the Havelock and Harlow communities to have a site closer to them. So, excited about that. Um, again, I, I can't say enough, um, and I'll hold it up one more time. Uh, folks still need to register online. That is the most important step. I know a lot of folks have done it, and I know there's 
been denials and things that have happened once they've had that first. But uh, again, I'd point you just like they did to the DRC for more in-person help with those claims. Okay. Court system reopened on last Thursday. Um, as I mentioned, there was some damage to the old courthouse. We worked closely with both the judges, Terry Sharp, our district attorney, and we really had a coordinated effort. And I want to thank those folks for being patient with us so we can prepare their building for the public. I think it's very important to have the court system back open. I'm sure like the commissioners do, uh, we need to transact business in this county. And that was certainly a big step forward. Um, social services, the emergency food stamp program, the DSNAP was authorized and began last Friday. Uh, it did run Saturday. It took Sunday off and started back this morning. I do not have a report from them today, but as of close of business Saturday, they'd seen over 2,100 folks come in that facility. That's over, you know, roughly 1,050 a day. Our highest day during Hurricane Matthew was 500. So we doubled Matthew two days in a row. But again, this is a much different storm than Matthew with a much wider net um, for that. Uh, folks who are currently on food stamps had um, already had an allotment added to their program. This is for folks who do not have food stamps that might have different criteria. And you heard from DSS folks last Tuesday explain that to you. I won't, I won't go into a lot of detail with that. Um, we did run a pod system logistics program that ended late last week. I think it went very well. I think commissioners were involved heavily in those pods in your communities. I think we met the need, uh, basic essentials for what folks need to sustain their life while they were in an emergency. I want to thank all the folks who donated, all the folks that volunteered. I mean, it was really a, a community effort and I was awfully proud uh, when I visited those sites to see that, that work together. And, um, and there was a couple staff, uh, Mr. Baker, Pam Hawkins, and Abigail Wilson, our economic development department, really took that on and did a great job with it. So I want to thank them for that. Schools update, uh, Dr. Doyle was here tonight. I wish she could give this because I'm, I'm not nearly the right person to do it. I did receive the same email and saw the same Facebook post that you saw. There are some limited staff uh, going back to work at uh, different times this week. It's projected students will start back October 8th. I, I, I'm saying projected because I haven't heard of, uh, for sure. I know she did post that, but um, we'll certainly follow up with her and make sure we can do whatever we need to help her uh, get back there. Uh, the school system is gracious uh, to allow us to use five schools as emergency shelters. Um, I've talked with her about some of the remediation efforts that went forward, and I also think uh, it would be something we need to consider from her at those costs of what she has to do to clean those schools up after that. So. I don't have anything from her at this time, but would like to bring that to you at another meeting. Okay, so that's sort of my hurricane uh, update there. If there's any subjects I didn't cover, I'd be happy to do that now. Any questions, Chair? Yes. Uh, you brought up damage assessment. Yes, you sir. You said the county and Newburgh be <clears throat> tied together. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> what about? The what do you what do you mean for the county? I mean, have you been down in the Harlow and yes, it's have locks? Reporting to you? I have Havelocks in okay. ours. Newman used a little bit different system. And that's in, in this, these totals? Yes, sir. Um, so look all of these totals you have here. It's correct. That's correct. This would be the county wide totals. Is, it's everyone, correct? That's my understanding. Okay. It's everyone. Okay. Yes, Thank sir. You. Okay. I, I had a couple additional items, if you don't mind. I'm Go sorry ahead. to keep you. I know it's been a long meeting. Uh, we do have a work session scheduled for October 15th. Um, you know, it's been a tough couple of weeks. I would certainly like to spend more time with the items uh, that we were going to talk about that day. I I'm just going to be honest. I'm, I'm not prepared to do so. I would ask that you consider having a special meeting on October 22nd, which is a Monday at 830, um, to accommodate that. I, I think I need the extra week with staff to um, pull that October together. October 22nd, is that a problem for anybody? So October the 15th, 22nd. It was scheduled for the 15th after our commission meeting. I'm just, quite frankly, not going to be ready for it. That's a Monday. Yes, sir. So I tried we to. We still have the meeting on the 15th, but we have a work session on the 22nd. And you'd like to do that at 830? Uh, if that's okay with the board. And some of those issues we need to readdress. Some of the things we were planning on talking right. about have certainly changed based on what we've been through. I'll, I'll be happy to have Nan poll you tomorrow and email you. And I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to leave with two final thoughts. One is I, I don't want to lose an opportunity to give you some good news. 
we were approved for a one NC grant for Project Grouse on September 18th in the middle of our recovery. And what that means for our county is over $2 million in investment and 33 new jobs. If there's ever a time we needed it, it was now. So I'm, I'm really pleased McGuckin and Pyle, the company from Pennsylvania, there was a couple articles in the paper. I'm sure most people were looking at all the other articles. But I, I think that shows the resiliency of our county. Those folks in their article talked about wanting to be a part of the recovery what the county had done and, and selling them on, on what a place this is to live and have your business. And I think that meant, meant a lot to me and my staff to, to see that announcement. I want to thank the state for approving a uh, financial package for them to make it happen, along with the county commissioners who, who started that, that a couple weeks ago. So I want to make that announcement to you. If you have any more questions about, you know, I'm, there, was, there was supposed to be a formal thing and it, it just got wiped out because of what we were doing. Lastly, um, I can't call uh, each employee by name, but guys, we got a great group of employees who uh, really stood out, and I'm proud of each and every one of them, and um, I appreciate what you did tonight for them, um, and I appreciate what you do every day for them, but we are blessed in this county with people who care about this county, who want to see it succeed, and want to see it be the best it can be, so I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Before we go into closed session, I just want to thank this gentleman here who was our protection tonight from the sheriff's office. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, at the same token, I'd like to, uh, I think it would be a good idea that if we let our people know to watch Channel 10 and they can get a lot of the information that was given here tonight by the FEMA people. I, I think they can watch that program and get the same information that was given to us tonight. Uh, and that goes, I think, three times during the week, if I'm not mistaken, what? the program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I heartily recommend that each of us tell our community people that they should be watching Channel 10 for those programs. What time, Chair? I believe they start at uh, 12. <laughs> what do you say? I didn't hear that. Whenever you want it. Oh, run it all day. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Friday mornings between eight and nine. <laughs> oh, he got to press on the gate. Okay. Uh, make a motion. Uh, go ahead, we got to go into closed session. Make a motion. Go into closed session. Uh, second. Second. All in favor, say aye. aye. We're now in closed session. Go.